Don't kill me, man! Don't kill me! Don't kill me, man! I'm not going to kill you. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? I am vengeance. I am the knight. Mike Radich here, and I'm now joining the phone by author Mark Reinhardt. Mark, how are you? Oh, doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Sure, no problem. Thanks for doing it. Mark, are you still doing public appearances as Batman? If so, are you available for my birthday next year? <laughs> My Batman costume, I, I have turned 53 now. My Batman costume is on a mannequin uh, d down in our basement, uh, and he stands down there and, and stands vigil over the house all the time. And I'd assumed as I'd gotten toward middle age, and I thought, I don't think I should be wearing this Batman costume anymore. So, yeah, I, I would probably have to, to find somebody else to play the part for you, but but, uh, but my Batman costume is, is standing tall and proud down in the basement right now. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love your book. The book is The Batman Filmography. And you say it right in the beginning of the book that you make a good Batman. And then I saw you in Batman watching over Gotham, and you were telling the truth. You actually do make a really good Batman. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. That And, and that is something funny. I think even people who know about either the book or my love of Batman don't know too much about that. But I had had the, the, the crazy uh, um, idea, and this is over 10 years ago now, is, is, is we were getting to the point that you know, uh, video technology, audio technology was ever more accessible in terms of just doing things on your own. I was like, I'm making my own Batman movie. None of, none of the Batman films that have come out have exactly been my Batman, mm -hmm. so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down and skulk around uh, uh, downtown Columbus at night on fire escapes and up on, on buildings and stuff like that and film film a little Batman movie the way I saw it. And that's actually the, the opening scene where the, the two kids are walking down the street talking about you know, if there really is a Batman. That's actually my, my sons, Taylor and Keaton. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they helped me in terms of being involved with it and filming it. We actually all played the music together. They're musicians uh, like, like me as well, too. So we, we had a blast doing that. But that was, that was my one and only film appearance. That's you know, like three minutes long, but I, I retired the cape and cow in terms of being on the screen since then. <laughs> hey, if you're only going to have one and only one film appearance, playing Batman is the way to go. That's the way I felt as well, too. It, it, it was pretty cool. It was a pretty liberating feeling to actually be in costume and climbing around fire escapes in the dark and stuff like that. I, I kind of uh, I kind of felt like I, I got a good feeling what it would be like to be Batman down there. <laughs> Mark, before we get going and talk about all things Batman in movies and on TV, could you give the audience a quick bio on yourself? Sure, sure. Um, I have been born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. I've been here all my life. And then my main job is a musician, actually. I'm a guitarist and, and a singer and work in a couple local bands here. And then that's actually my, my full-time gig. But as a writer, I had become interested in, in a, a couple different topics. I actually sort of got led into writing just by the idea of there were books I wanted to own that I wanted to be able to read about my, my, uh, uh, my interests, or you might even say obsessions. Uh, uh, that didn't exist. So I was like, I, I, I think this book ought to exist. And so that's how my writing career began. And I had written a book called Abraham Lincoln on Screen about film and TV portrayals of Abraham Lincoln from the silent era up till uh, modern times. And that the first edition of that book was published in, in 99. And, and that's what sort of led me into writing. And the second edition uh, was published right at the time of Lincoln's, the bicentennial of his birth in 2009. And after that, I tackled the, the Batman filmography first edition of that came out. I forget what year that would have been. I think 2005. Mm -hmm. The second edition, though, that's the one I would recommend mm -hmm. that everybody find uh, because that that one uh, is, is is much more complete. Has all the Nolan films in it, and, and I will I will not be bashful about saying that that book to me is something. There are not many books that, that do a good job of covering Batman's you know 75 year history mm -hmm. at the at the time of the 75th anniversary. This is a book that really gets it all in terms of not only is it about the movie. But it's about TV shows, it's about comic books, graphic novels, even uh, video games and stuff like that. I feel like I did a pretty good job in terms of summing up a real summation of the character's history in a way that no other book does. So after that, though, I returned to kind of a, being a musician. Um, I, I had written a book on my uh, guitar idol, my sort of lifelong 
uh, musical idol Chet Atkins uh, called Chet Atkins the greatest songs of Mr. Guitar uh, and that sort of combined my two loves of music and writing and since then I've done nothing I don't know what I'll ever do again I've talked about doing a, another revision to the Lincoln book that might happen uh, down the road some ways but, but at this point I'm just happy being here in town and, and playing and working as a musician and, 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 uh, and still doing the off-writing project This interview will contain spoilers. That's why I'd hit you guys really quick with the spoiler alert. So now that you've been warned, let's get back to the interview. Okay, Mark, now let's get into it. Let's start with the Batman movies. And there's no better place to start than back at the beginning, which of course was the first Batman serial in 1943. Now I'm curious because at this point, Superman is the more popular character between the two. And outside of the comics, Superman had done more than Batman. The only thing Superman hasn't done yet is make a live-action production. He had the Superman radio show, and he had the Max Fleischer cartoons, but he never did anything in live-action at this point. Now, of course, Batman wasn't the first superhero serial. That was The Adventures of Captain Marvel, But Batman from 1943 came out five years before Superman with Kirk Allen. So why does Batman make the jump from the page to the stage sooner than Superman, even though Superman was the more popular character at that time? Yeah, I I don't know that, and that's a very interesting question, but in terms of why that might be, uh, the the one thing, that, the, the quick answer that I would have said is is the idea that the, the special effects that Superman was going to require, you think about it in the 40s, mm-hmm. that for a low-budget serial, that would have been a much more difficult thing. And I still think that, that might be, might very well be the answer, that Batman was going to be an easier character to bring to the screen in, in terms of not having to try and have the character fly and stuff like that. Um, but 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 in a way, that, that argument may not be, it doesn't necessarily hold water in the sense that the Captain Marvel serial, which, which was done, was, had incredible flying scenes. Mm-hmm. They actually uh, did, did such a fine job of special effects in terms of showing, showing that character flying. But it does seem like that, that in terms of whoever had the rights to Superman didn't have quite the same special effects moxie, because if you remember that first, uh, the first serial that was done, they finally decided uh, they, they just couldn't get good flying scenes. I think they were using wires and it, mm. it, you could see the wires and stuff. So they ended up animating Superman. So Superman turns into a mm. cartoon as he's you know running on the ground up, up and away, jumps into the air, he turns into a cartoon. So uh, it, it certainly does seem that special effects might have had uh, some reason to do with that. And it really is just a couple years off in terms of uh, you know Batman and then Superman. But but that, that would still probably be my stock answer. I can't think of anything else in terms of rights or anything like that. I, I, I would I would think that special effects maybe led them to the Batman character thinking that would be easier. The first Batman serial, 15 chapters, released by Columbia Pictures in 1943. Let's start with the good. What does the first Batman movie serial do right? There are some some cool Batman moments in there. I, I really do. It, it, it's one that obviously still continues to just get pasted in terms of how bad the acting and the story and, and, and the, so much of the production values are. And, and rightfully so, it is pretty rough. But in terms of what it gets right... Um, I love uh, Chapter 2, the, the Bat's Cave, when you get the first scene when Batman and Robin are actually interrogating uh, a thug they brought into the, into the Bat Cave, or actually they called it at that point the Bat's Cave. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, is still just so Batman. And there's other moments where all of a sudden you see Batman in silhouette as he you know, spreads his arms wide and his you know, cape, cape comes out as he's jumping down and stuff like that. There, there are moments in it that are real uh, great Batman imagery. Um, and I, I love Louis. Wilson and Douglas Croft is, is Batman and Robin, respectively. Um, uh, Lewis Wilson, to me, is he—he he looks the part. He plays a, a bored Bruce Wayne, really fun as well, too. Uh, and Douglas Croft to have a kid, Robin. It's really the only time within uh, the, the entire history of the character that you that you have a Robin that, that is truly a boy wonder. You know, like like the character. 
character is always called Robin the Boy Wonder. And the interaction between the two of them is, is really fun and, you know, kind of father and son uh, type of thing. I, I, I enjoy, I enjoy them. So, so that, that to me, the, just to, to watch those two work and to see Batman on screen for the first time, that, that's, that's the good as far as I'm concerned. There's so many things working against this serial. Strike one is that it was released by Columbia Pictures. Outside of the Shadow, Deadwood Dick, The Phantom, The Spider's Web, and The Spider Returns, I don't really like any of the Columbia serials. I've always been more of a Republic Pictures kind of guy when it comes to old movie serials because they made a way better product. So there's that strike. Then strike two is the casting. I love Lewis Wilson as Batman and Douglas Croft as Robin. I think they do a great job. But we have Charles Middleton, arguably the greatest villain in the history of movie serials. He played Ming the Merciless in three Flash Gordon serials. And he played 39013 in maybe the greatest movie serial of all time, Daredevils of the Red Circle. But in this serial, he's underused because he only appears in three chapters. And his talents are wasted because he doesn't play the main villain or a villain. And the villain that we do get in this serial is Dr. Daka, and he's really, really weak. J. Carol Nash, the actor who plays Dr. Daka, is a good actor, but he has nothing to work with in this serial. Strike three is the fact that we don't get to see any of the great villains from Batman's rogues gallery. Charles Middleton would have made a great scarecrow, and I agree with you when you wrote in your book, J. Carol Nash would have made a great Joker, but we get Dr. Daka, who's so ridiculous and so offensive on so many different levels that it ruins the movie. Then there's the fact that it's a World War II propaganda picture, and as we get further and further away from this era, a lot of the stuff doesn't make sense, so it doesn't hold up. The costumes are terrible, but the worst thing is the car. They should have just got a black car and stuck a big bat logo on the front of it and called it a day. Because during this time, in the comics, the Batmobile did suck. It wasn't a spectacular vehicle like it is today. Back then, it was just a regular car with a bat logo and maybe like a a bat fin on the back. It wasn't anything great. So this serial is very flawed on so many different levels, but besides what I just mentioned, what else does this serial get wrong? Well, and I, I'd expand on what you just said about the Batmobile. I think that that's so perfect what you're saying, the fact that they picked this you know, convertible sedan with a white top and stuff mm-hmm. like that. All you needed, those great big old cars, and you, know, you get, get a, a, a flashy black car and, mm-hmm. and, and do some sort of bat head on the front of it you know, with, with maybe you know, uh, yellow eyes mm-hmm. or something like that. And then you, you know, you've, the, the serial just improves tremendously with just, just that one little thing, and it wouldn't have taken anything to do. And, uh, and I agree with you um, uh, in terms of in, in terms of both Middleton and Nash. I mean, just just the the casting in terms of what those guys were capable of. They really didn't get to to, to do what they could have done at all. It's funny, Jack, uh, um, Nash, in terms of what he wears, almost looks like the Joker. You take yeah. away his uh, his mustache, and he could actually you know cackle and be the Joker with, without you know without any problem whatsoever. So so those things. Um, Oh, it's okay. So I will add this. Actually, is, is you mentioned these things um, in terms of what have become staples of the Batman mythos within the comics. Um, these great villains of the Batmobile. You know, something else that you miss out on completely is Commissioner Gordon. You don't have Commissioner Gordon in there. You don't have the Bat Signal in there. You know, some of these other things that are real already time honored traditions with the character not even being five years old. They just chose not to do these things, um, and, and that is that that is far and away one of the biggest problems. And just to reiterate what you said, by far the biggest problem of all is is just the overt racism that, that's mm-hmm. you know in it in, in terms of in terms of the anti Japanese uh, propaganda. It's just it's just shameful. It was shameful at the time. As mm-hmm. we get further and further away from it, it it's just just unbearable to watch that. Mm-hmm. And it has been you know it was released on VHS at the time of uh, of the '89 Batman coming out. Um, you know when everyone was trying to capitalize. 
guys on on Batman merchandise and stuff, and and that is the one time that there were some rough edits done um, to actually try and get rid of some of the Japanese propaganda in there. What serial costume do you like better, the one from 1943 or the one from 1949? Because they're both very rough. I mean, the 43 one looks like a bad cosplay, and the one from 1949 looks like Devil Man. Like, he kind of is a cross between Daredevil and Batman. Like, they're both really rough, but what one do you like better? Boy, it, yeah, it's so tough because... Uh... I mean, the, the 43 in terms of how lumpy and misshapen, you know, in the age before spandex in terms of the, the, the body suit and stuff like that, and that, like, giant sort of almost like a Santa Claus belt that he's wearing in the ears or sort of pointy wrong directions and stuff. Mm-hmm. But yet, I, I can't then point to the 43 costume being a whole lot better because of, like you say, the ears are just pointing, like, straight out like devil ears. It doesn't make any sense at all, and it also is almost impossible. It looks like a bird mask. It's almost impossible impossible for uh, um, Robert Lowry to, to see out of that thing. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's better. And one other weird thing about the 49 is the gloves are all wrong in terms of, like, they did, like, sort of tall gloves and they gave him work gloves to put actually over his hands and stuff like that. I, I think once you take off the mask of the uh, of the 49 costume and just see sort of the general body suit and the, the bad emblem and stuff like that is probably the better costume. But, but given the silly mask, I think it's 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 pretty much a toss of you know choose your poison between the two of them (laughs) the second batman serial batman and robin released in 1949 again by columbia pictures and again in 15 chapters this serial features more of the traditional serial elements that we're used to because in this serial we have the main villain the wizard who throughout the entire serial, the audience has to try and figure out who he could be. And that's supposed to be the hook to get the kids to come back to the theaters week after week to see who the wizard really is. But again, the wizard is not the villain we're looking for. He's more in line with the great serial villains of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, like Don DeLauro from Zorro's Fighting Legion, the Crimson Ghost from the serial of the same name, the Skull from Deadwood Dick, the Lightning from the Fighting Devil Dogs, Captain Mephisto from Manhunt on Mystery Island, the Octopus from the Spider's Web, the Gargoyle from the Spider Returns. He's more like those characters. Now, in all fairness, he's way better than Dr. Daka, but he still doesn't compare to the great villains that Batman has in his rogues gallery. The Wizard would be a really good villain for, let's say, Captain Marvel, just like the Scorpion in The Adventures of Captain Marvel, but it's not a good villain for Batman. Batman has, top to bottom, the greatest villains of all time, so when we don't get one of those big-time villains, it's a huge letdown. But there's a lot to like about this serial. There's Commissioner Gordon, there's the Bat Signal, there's a lot of good things in this serial. So, what does this serial do right? Um, I I would say offhand that even with all the flaws of the 43, I'm probably still more of a fan of the 43 than the 49 because the 49 is so maddeningly inept in terms of its storytelling and and, and, and just uh, it just meanders around in such a crazy fashion and so often looks so much more like a western than it does like a uh, uh, a sort of crime drama mm-hmm. type thing. There's so many like out west scenes and even music pulled from uh, some some western movies and stuff like that. Um, but but that said, there's still things that, like you say that I think it it, it does do right. Um, I, I am I'm a fan of I can't remember which episode it was. The, the 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 fight on top of the train uh, I think is probably the, the coolest scene uh, with, with within that that particular serial that, that that's one like I say I sort of pointed out one particular uh, scene that I like from the 43 and I kind of feel that way about the 49 that that that, that train fight is is really really cool like a, a great Batman moment on film and so forth 
Um, I'm. What else can I say I like about it? Um, I. I guess honestly, I like 43 better. There's so many things that bug me about the 49 that that's that's about the only thing I can really come up with. I don't feel like the the chemistry between Robert Lowry as Batman and, and uh, Johnny Duncan as Robin is as good as is the, the the 43 was. Um, Johnny Duncan's still a pretty cool Robin. I'll give you that as well too. He's he's a little bit older. He's he's more. I forget what his age actually was, but he still can come across as more of a teen wonder as opposed to, uh, as opposed to a boy wonder. And, and then he's he's good. His enthusiasm in the role is cool. So so I, I like that. What does this 1949 serial get wrong? Um, well, like I say, the storytelling to me, um, what they end up doing in terms of trying to guess the identity of the wizard, they you know they they give you a, uh, a a crazy sort of character cheat at the very end that, that if if you've been sticking around trying to figure out who the wizard is, it doesn't make the slightest bit of sense. Oh, and by far the greatest part is Professor Hamill, who is uh, supposedly confined to a wheelchair, and it's like oh well, he can't be the wizard because he's confined to a wheelchair. He's inventing some sort of uh, science scientific process that allows him to walk uh, and you keep seeing him dramatically going in and being in this sort of electric chair and getting up and being able to walk. Uh, one of the late chapters, he actually walks in uh, to a room with all of the characters, you know, what's going on here? And, and he's walking, you know, when he's been uh, in a wheelchair the whole time. Nobody even mentions it. <laughs> they, they look at him walking and say, oh, Professor Hamill, oh, no, everything's fine. He goes walking out and it never occurs for anyone to say, hey, wait a second, that's the guy that's the wheelchair bound guy who couldn't have been the wizard because he's in a wheelchair. I mean, that's that's how crazy disjointed the the story in that particular uh, serial ended up being. <laughs> so yeah, that out of everything, in terms of it looking so much like a western and being just just so uh, crazily bad written, uh, those are the things that I find to be the biggest flaws with it. Superman dominates the 1950s with George Reeves in the Adventures of Superman. Batman doesn't make the jump to television during this decade. He's just doing his thing in the comics. So why does Batman disappear from the screen in the 50s? Well, so much of that was about the Comics Code Authority. You know, it is uh, that the the book Seduction of the Innocent had come out and sort of you know, claiming that comics were you know perverting young minds and so forth. Uh, um, all comics were sort of forced out of their their more gory, uh, you know, kind of kind of adult themes and stuff like that, and became a, a more sort of escapist fantasy kitty type of a world. And obviously, that worked perfectly for Superman, being the sci fi character, fantasy character that he was. Um, Basically, what happens to Batman is he becomes just Superman in a Batman suit. Uh, it all gets very sci-fi, gets very fantasy, gets very wholesome and stuff like that. So, so a lot of the, the sort of film noir, you know, murder and, and violence and, and scary villains of the you know the late thirties and forties uh, is, is thrown out to allow Batman to become a much sunnier character uh, be, because of the Comics Code Authority uh, brought on by the Seduction of the Innocent. And you do have to say that that, that, that Wortham's uh, uh, accusations cast a very, very long shadow, and it still gets discussed uh, to, to this day. Uh, and if, if he was a great Batman villain, uh, just like all the other villains, though, he couldn't even slightly bring him down. Batman, <laughs> Batman still continues on, you know, at a furious pace. So Wortham didn't didn't slow any of us up in terms of our uh, affection and enthusiasm for the character. Now we discovered the. 1966 Batman TV series at the same point in our lives, but your life was 30 years earlier than mine. I discovered it as a toddler in the 90s. You discovered it as a toddler when it actually aired back in 1966. So what was it about the 1966 Batman TV series with Adam West and Burt Ward that sucked you in and made you a a lifelong fan? Yeah, and it, it is fun to say that I got to be there at the at the ground floor of that. But as a you know, a two and a half year old, three year old kid, I still my memories are are completely just just crystal clear of, of being that age and just being completely just just overwhelmed uh, by 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 the character. You know, just just uh, you know, my my obsession started started that hard and that fast at that age and just never ever let up. Um, and and to me, uh, the point that I make in the book. Is is that obviously the, the 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 Batman, you know, both the TV series and the movie that came from it were played for laughs in the sense that it was that it, it was on the two levels of the 
camp humor, but for kids it could be looked at as you know action adventure and stuff like that. And I will tell you straight out that as a kid, it was action adventure to me. Yeah. The, the, the funny stuff I wasn't seeing at all. Still, the the opening scenes of the '66 film is is you know they they you know race down the bat poles, get get into the Batmobile, and and go and get the Batcopter, and 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 they're you know headed out to find uh, Commodore Schmidt Labs yacht and stuff like that. That to me was thrilling, and I can still watch those scenes and, and you know, sort of sort of feel in my heart that that my my three four year old self that just saw that is just wow, this is just the the, the finest in action adventure. This is this is absolutely riveting, uh, and obviously it gets much much sillier as the as the show goes on. The second that the shark is grabbing Batman's leg, it's it's very obvious that we're being played for laughs. But but as a kid, it was for me, it was the action adventure. It was the hero. It was with his in, incredible, you know, crime fighting arsenal and his absolutely, you know, true north uh, persona of, you know, he was a hero and he was going to to, to um, see justice done and stuff like that. And that's still that's still what you know speaks to me about Batman. You know, after all these years uh, in the the '66 show, even with with its silliness as a as a kid, that's that's what grabbed me. <clears throat> oh, and I should point out too. Um, it's interesting to me. Once everything was finally released on on Blu-ray, um, and you could see, especially the first season, which was basically only a, a, a half season, when you could really see it in all its glory, you know, released in really high high def and stuff like that. In terms of how good it looks and and how some of those episodes from the first season do play far more action adventure than than uh, than just straight up comedy. It, it got broader. It got campier as time went on. As they were trying to you know hold on to their audience and you know like so often you know things get get sillier and more forced on a show and stuff like that but those those first uh some of those first episodes in the first season to me still still play just a little bit noirish you have moments where you know batman and robin are breaking into interrogate a criminal that that uh that gordon's got held and stuff like that and there's there's some night scenes and shadows and stuff like that I was like hey that's that's batman that, that's still very much the the batman that we all know and love my favorite episode of the Batman TV series is the two-parter. It starts with the first part. It's Joker's Last Laugh. It's the one where he has that robot, Mr. Glee, who he's put in as a teller at the Gotham First National Bank, and he is printing out all this fake money, and the cliffhanger is that he's going to press Robin into a comic book. I really love that two-parter. That's my favorite episode of the Batman TV series. What's your favorite episode of that show? Boy, my favorites, my favorites would fall within the first season. The first Catwoman appearance, and man, what was that one called? The Perfect Crime, I think. Mm-hmm. The first one with, with Julie Newmar, right. um, and and uh, um, where she's stealing a couple cat statues that are actually going to give her a, a a map to 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 get to some buried treasure under Gotham. But but between that and then the the Joker's first appearance, and what was that one? Boy, I can't remember what the Joker first appearance was called. Um, is it the Joker's Wild? Yeah, I think it is yeah. the Joker's yeah. Wild. I can't remember what the name of the yeah. second one is. Um, I was trying, maybe, oh, maybe the Joker's Wild, Batman is Wild, now that yeah. I think about yeah. it. But the very first Joker that you get um, is 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 fabulous. And, and, and you know, there's a, a scene where uh, where um, the Joker has, has broken into a performance of uh, the opera. Yeah, Pagliacci. Pagliacci, yeah. And he's actually wearing yeah. the, uh, the, the crazy kind of rubber clown mask the same ones that uh, um, that, that Nolan used right. for uh, for the mm-hmm. Dark Knight, right. uh, and you see that it's like, yo, know, this still is very Batman. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would I would actually put those two up. But but within within that first uh, within that first season, you get the fabulous uh, um, two part episode arcs with with uh, with the Joker, with the Riddler, with the Penguin, and the Catwoman, with all the the major villains. So I would actually say all of those from that from that first season, you know, when it was played a little bit more straight than the than the silliest of the shows is, is, is my absolute favorite. Of the traditional Batman villains, so Joker, Catwoman, Penguin, Riddler, all those characters, of those characters that appear on the show, who's your favorite? Boy, I, I love them all equally. I, I, I think I think that they all were so good that they still... Um, <laughs> They still define the characters to this day. Um, so, so 
I'm, I'm gonna gonna say all all four of them. I, I I couldn't pick an absolute favorite, and I'd I'd maybe ask Cesar Romero to sh- shave his mustache. I wish that he would have <laughs> shaved it because especially now that everything's released in high depth, you can see that more. Uh, but but uh, but even even that, I'm still not gonna gonna hold much against him. To me, they they all play those roles with such glee. Um, they're, they're just all so fabulous. I I think that I think that I couldn't pick a favorite out of all of them. I I, I love all four of them. I never knew that Cesar Romero had his mustache painted over because prior to it being released on DVD and high definition, Blu-ray, all that stuff, you couldn't really tell. And then I saw Return to the Batcave, the misadventures of Adam and Bert or whatever that was called. And then that's when they released it. And now I see it every time. Like now I just can't take my eyes away from it. I I, that's that the way gonna... I am too. And I try, I try not to look. I try not to see it, but I do. And you know what's so funny when you think about it? Right now, um, they had to do reshoots for Justice League mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, with, with uh, um, uh, the actor who plays Superman. Oh, I can't remember. Henry his name. Cavill. Uh, Henry Cavill. Yeah. And uh, and he's supposedly doing some western right now, and he's growing a mustache, and they wouldn't let him shave it off. So supposedly in these scenes that they filmed the, the, the extra reshoots, they're going to actually CGI out his mustache. <laughs> um, and so it, all of a sudden it dawns on me, you know, with, with Cesar Romero, maybe we'll eventually get a another Blu-ray release. Like, hey, we'll CGI out the mustache, so it really isn't there. Yeah, but we'll probably still try and watch it to see if we can, uh, you know, perceive where the mustache was or something yeah. like that. <laughs> and I suppose it's, it's a part of the history now. That's just just the way it is. Uh, that then that's okay. But I, I'm the same way as you. I, I can't I can't look away. I kind of like it when the character's in more long shots, so I don't don't see it so much. I wonder what he looks like without that mustache because that was his trademark. That's why he never shaved it off. And I'm a huge fan of Cesar Romero. Like I've, I love all his, his work. You know, he was the Cisco Kid in the '40s, and he, I mean, he was in basically every genre. He's a, a well versed actor. So I, I've always wondered what he looks like without that mustache. But now, of the non traditional villains like King Tut, Egghead, the Bookworm, Sham, False Face, all those villains that appeared on this show. Do you have a favorite of the non-traditional villains? Oh, I would probably say, again, it's first season, and what is her name? Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, um, the girl who uh, is the is the escape artist. Um, oh shoot, and I can't remember what what her what her character's name was. Um, boy, I'd have to go and look that up. Anyway, she's that's an episode that is that's got quite a feel of a sort of film noir type thing. And in fact, that's the only episode where you actually get some henchmen that are that are killed that are actually gunned down by machine gun fire and stuff. Um, I would say that, that that her episode is is, is one of my favorites of the uh, um, of the non traditional villains. I I guess kind of though. Like I say, you mention all those, but but really, in in my head, it's still all about the Joker, Penguin, Riddler, Catwoman. The the the, the main villains are always the ones that, that come back to me. A lot of the the more hokey uh, guest villains didn't didn't you know didn't hold up quite so well as far as I was concerned. Is Zelda the Great the character you're thinking of? Zelda, that's it. Zelda the Great. Yeah, I I, I wanted to say another who's yeah. Marsha Queen of Diamonds. Wasn't there a Marsha? Maybe that was yeah. a later one. I can't yeah, there, remember. There, there, there Zelda were a bunch. The Great of... is, is exactly yeah. the one. Yes, that's yeah. uh, and, and and that's sort of a, a great character, like say almost a little noir esque uh, uh, in the way she plays that character. So um, uh, yeah, she's uh, she's my favorite out of, out of the non traditional. There were three actresses who played Catwoman on the show. Julie Newmar, well, Lee Merriweather didn't play it on the show. She pl- she did appear on the show, but she didn't play Catwoman. She appeared in Batman the movie as Catwoman. And then there was Eartha Kitt, who also played Catwoman. So who's your favorite Catwoman? Uh, Julie Newmar would still be my favorite out of out of all of them, and especially in the Perfect Crime, that first one to me, um, it actually at moments even almost looks like a you know a live action version of Batman the Animated Series. The opening sequences when when she's breaking into the museum to uh, to steal the the uh, artifact she's trying to get and stuff like that, it, it looks for all the world like like an animated series episode. Um, and, and they're all all three great, but she's my favorite. My favorite Mr. Freeze for the longest time was always Eli Wallach, but I recently went back and watched the George Sanders episodes with him as Mr. Freeze, and I flip-flopped. I gotta say, I like George Sanders as the best Mr. Freeze. So there were three actors who played Mr. Freeze on the show, George Sanders, Eli Wallach, and Otto Priminger. Of those three, who's your favorite? 
with the George Sanders with the first season. Like I say, I'm so partial to, to everything from the first season. Yeah. So I, I would I would probably go and pick him as well too. And even even with that that the episode has some sort of clunky special effects, but but he's great in it and in the overall episode is is great. And obviously that's a character that does have roots in the comics as well too. Now there's Oh, you know, one other thing to to go back just a second, there was something that you had said that interested me so much. Um talking about Cesar Romero, um I don't know if you've seen this or not, but but he had uh, um, he had actually done uh, an interview yes, for yes, somebody in yep. Austin, Texas, when mm-hmm. when the Batman film had premiered. Right. Uh, and talking, he was in his uh, in, in his um, makeup, mm-hmm. not wearing his full costume, but but in his makeup, sitting in a dressing room, uh, talking with this woman that he had known for years uh, about Batman and the premiere and stuff like that. Very very interesting to see him just in his regular demeanor with a friend. Yeah. Uh, as he's wearing all that that crazy makeup and stuff. Uh, That is still such a fascinating chapter in Batman history that when that film premiered, they premiered it in Austin, and I forget who all went. I think... um I think Lee Merriweather and, mm-hmm. and uh, obviously Cesar Romero and Adam West not only went to the premiere, but went to the premiere, you know, riding down the, the street in convertibles in costume going into the theater. You know, something that, that in today's day and age, that kind of craziness for a movie premiere, you know, uh, actors would never do that show up in costume like it was almost a, you know, your Disney character festival or something like that. Uh, but, but such an amazing thing to see him just casually talk as, as he's in his full Joker makeup and stuff. I saw interviews with Adam West, Lee Merriweather, and that interview that you were talking about, and he's he's in like a white tee, and he's yeah, got he's a in cigarette. White yeah, yeah with he's with got a cigarette Joker coat off. Yeah, yeah, he's he's in a white t-shirt with a cigarette. It's just it's just so great. It, so it, great. And the fact that he knew that that woman in Austin, who's the newswoman, yeah. is somebody that he'd known for years. Right. That they were actually friends, mm-hmm. and so his easy rapport with her, just talking talking with her, just as, as an old friend, uh, as he's in this crazy ghastly makeup and it's just yeah that's that's an amazing uh, th- those films to me that, that like a time machine back to that moment you know in terms of in terms of that mania that it's just just so fabulous and anyone who wanted to find that i'm sure they could find it on on youtube i think that's where i had originally tracked them now but just an amazing little artifact of the, the you know the 66 batman uh, craziness now a lot of people don't like this character and and she really in a roundabout way is really irrelevant to basically every episode minus a couple but do you like aunt harriet i don't mind aunt harriet it, it's it's great comic relief because it's almost always as she's is as she's you know just like oh i can't believe they're running off again it, it just yeah. it just is, is sort of a silly fun little thing and every now and again she gets dragged in as a hostage or something like that yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah i don't i don't mind aunt harriet a bit how many fishing trips are yeah, how Bruce? Many, and- how many could they take before she would find and say, "What's <laughs> going on here?" And that great that great moment in the uh, in the first episode yeah. when when uh, the, they talk about their fishing trips is is, is is Bruce and Dick are like, "Boy, when Aunt Harry really finds out what our fishing trips are, you know, she's yeah. going to be just going to kill her." Yeah, that, that's that's so kind of kind of crazy, uh, sort of oh, almost almost creepy and in, in, in under the table and stuff. That's pretty funny. <laughs> I love how Burt Ward is always like let down when he realizes that he has to go and be Robin. Like, oh, hey, we're going to go on a fishing trip. Holy Barracuda! And then he realizes, oh, Commissioner Gordon's on the phone. You're, you're not being serious. Or, oh, Dick, we have to go to that ball game. Holy Sandy Koufax! And then, oh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds swell, Bruce. And then, yeah, and then they go off. That's a heck of a job, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's sort of a concept that goes on over the years. You think about the, the kid in Batman Beyond, like, oh, man, i got to get yeah. to work. You know, <laughs> Bruce, is, Bruce is riding me again here. <laughs> now, every time I see a Batgirl episode, I always get excited. I, I really love Yvonne Craig as Batgirl. Every time I see the her, her and her Batgirl psycho go across the screen, I always get excited in the opening credits whenever I see the show on TV. Are you a fan of Batgirl? I know you said that you really love the season one episodes, but when she's introduced into the show, are you a fan? Um, 
Yeah, and I, I, I love the character, and I love Yvonne Craig playing her. But, but to me, the, the show has fallen so completely off by that third season. Um, everything that they were doing, that they, they didn't have anywhere near the production values of, of, of the first season. That they had cut it so far back. Almost everything is filmed on the same soundstage with kind of really minimal props and stuff like that. You get the get the feeling like like you're sort of watching amateur hour in terms of the way a lot of that's put together. She's great, but but generally the format and and just the overall look of the show it, it slipped enough that, that I I'm I'm a fan of hers, but I'm just not a fan of the third season in general. But just just because of that fact that that, that things had you know the the bloom was off the rose. Did you see Batman the movie when it was released in theaters? I know you said you were really young when that show started, but when that movie was released, did you actually go and see it in the theater? I saw it in the theaters when I was a kid, but my guess is it was still a revival. Mm, and I'm, okay. it's funny because I have very distinct memories of that, but I was a little bit older in early grade school. And and, and, and this is still, it's so, uh, this, I haven't talked about this maybe to anyone ever, but it all of a sudden comes to mind. Uh, when I was in elementary school, I remember they passed out little mimeograph sheets uh, with the Batman logo saying it was on one of our school days off. It's like, oh, if you're going to be off, you can go to such and such movie theater and, and see they're going to show the Batman movie there. And, you know, obviously, like really, really bad printing with, with, the, with the Batman logo on there, but being excited about the fact that like, oh, I'm going to get to go see the Batman movie. So, yes, I did see it in the theaters, but my guess is they had done some revivals that probably would have been uh, early 70s as, as opposed to actual uh, 66. I, I did not, uh, I was so little at that point, I would have been two years old. I'm sure mom and dad did not take me to the movie theaters at that original uh, release but within within just a couple of years after that you know when i was young grade school i did actually get to see it in the theaters batman the movie is more remembered i would probably say than the actual tv series because there's that great line in the movie some days you just can't get rid of a bomb there's the the bat boat the bat copter like the those two vehicles don't even appear in the actual show the only time they actually appear on the batman tv series is in stock footage from that movie but people they really remember those certain elements that happen in that movie and obviously there's more but those are the first two that come off of the top of my head but is that just a product of batman the movie has been released for all these years and people have been able to get it and and people remember that a little bit more because they've been so disattached from the tv series that hadn't been available to the public i mean except for bootlegs and maybe it being shown occasionally on tv why is it so much that when when people think of batman the movie they they add those elements into the show Yes, I, I think I think the availability, the actual um, consumer availability, is the the huge reason why um, Batman the movie never went out. You, you could always get that on mm-hmm. some sort of format or another. You know, by um, you know by the time that home video was being released, it was it was out on VHS tape, uh, you know, VHS to DVD to to Blu-ray. Never stopped. You know, you, you were you were always able to get a hold of that film. And like I say, in revivals, I was seeing it through the 70s still in, in revivals at that point. That was just a, a way to, to see it. Now, and, and maybe the fact that you do have some of these great things like the Bat Boat and the Bat Copter, they were so dramatic uh, visually that that's something that does stick in people's minds. I think the availability and these these extra production values are probably what, what kept that as, as, a, uh, as, as an absolute uh, just, just uh, sort of... Uh, it formed in people's minds in a way that it just, you know, that just, like, like it never went away for people. But since the series, I, I, the TV series, though, since it was in syndication, it was always showing somewhere. Mm-hmm. And in, and I think because of that, it still did resonate with people, but it just didn't have the, the same kind of availability that the, that, that the film did. Um, but, but you're right in terms of so many of the scenes in the film, that, that is still what, what people tend to remember the most about the 66. Batmania time and stuff. Um, but as I was a kid in, in, in the grade school, kind of like you said, I was still seeing it in syndication on TV. And, and because of that, I feel like I still got got the chance to enjoy the TV show in, in a way that was similar to the movie as well. Obviously, when the show was at its highest point in popularity, it was, you know, Batmania, everyone was going crazy, everyone loved it. But as as soon as it rose to being a very popular show, it 
fell and, and no one cared about it anymore. Why did people stop caring about the show? Obviously, it goes hand in hand. The production quality got worse as the popularity of the show was going down. But why did people stop caring about this show as quickly as they did start caring about it? Why did that happen? Well, I think with fads, so often, you know, but we see the same uh, sort of sort of uh, uh, sequence of events in so many fad situations. Something becomes white hot, everybody does it, then everybody is completely sick of it, and then, it, you know, eventually people nostalgically go, oh yeah, I, I did love that, you know, and all of a sudden, hey, let's do the Macarena for, for a second and laugh about it when we used to do it all the time, you know, when it completely died out. I, I think I think it's all those things, that, that so many things in pop culture. Pop culture is so disposable. Uh, something that over the years i thought about more and more. There's so many people that had you know, number one records and stuff like that that are just instantly gone, you know, and, and you never hear from them again. <laughs> to me, that is... Um, that is just the nature of pop culture that so much is not going to be remembered uh, and I think what that's what happened with Batman it did become so passe but the power of the character uh, would eventually you know resurrect itself in a in a completely different manner that it was was still going to come back but but to me that's that's why the show went because because people when something is that white hot and becomes that that big of a deal you know people take it in you know gobble it all up until they're just absolutely sick of it and then want to want to leave it behind after the third season abc canceled the show nbc was going to pick up the show but unfortunately the sets were all destroyed and it would have cost nbc a fortune to recreate them so they decided to just scrap the whole thing and they didn't pick it up for a fourth season now had nbc been able to to either you know pony up the dough to recreate the sets or them not be destroyed in the first place could a fourth season have made a difference? It would be very interesting to know what they would have done. Would they have continued to try and play it broader uh, as, as they've continued to do from first to second to third seasons? Would it have been? Would it have been that same type of thing? Uh, my guess is that, that Batman was so ingrained in people's heads as, as, as the camp character and, and more silly type of thing that they couldn't have done it any other way. Um, God only knows what they would have done with it. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I can't even imagine. You know, does it all of a sudden look like laughing or something like that? Are there guest stars and musical numbers and just uh, just you know complete craziness or something like that? I can't believe in any way, shape, or form that it would have ever reverted back to the Bob Kane, Bill Finger version of the character. To me, whatever was going to happen would have probably gotten just sillier. So maybe, maybe we're better off that we didn't get a fourth season. I don't know. So many people bailed off of the Batman character altogether. I mean, some people weren't really even true fans. They just showed up because it was a fad and it was the cool thing to do, watch that show. So the character's popularity completely went downhill once the TV show ended. But why did you stay on board? Why did you decide to remain a fan? Well, it's kind of funny. As I think back on that time... As I had become interested in comics, uh, you know, and there was a time, I suppose I talked about being a little kid and going to see the, the, the film and revivals and theaters and just being a Batman fan. There, uh, My Batman fandom never went away, and like my Batman stuff might have gotten packed up as I, you know, headed toward uh, teenage years and stuff like that. But it was, it's kind of weird, I think about it, it was always, it was always there, you know, furtively every now and again you open up a box and look at all your old Batman stuff and say, boy, I sure did love this stuff. It's, it's, it's not it's not for a grown up person. It's not not for not for a teenage kid. But boy, I, that, that Batman stuff was great. Uh, so I, I, I it's kind of hard to remember. I suppose though, even before that, in my grade school years, since I was still a fan, it led me into comics and getting some of the comics. At that point, there were things a number of things that were being republished. Some of those old, uh, you know, like Batman uh, number one, Detective Comics twenty seven were were reprinted in their entirety and getting to see those old noirish stories and stuff like that you know brought me a new appreciation for the character that was you know deeper than than just the 66 uh, silliness and stuff uh so i suppose i suppose i started to gravitate toward it by seeing comic book uh reprints and then felt like as i was heading into my teen years oh batman's for kids i can't can't be doing that but i couldn't i couldn't ever really give it up <laughs> 
in the mainstream, Batman had faded away because he was no longer on TV as the 1970s rolled in. But in the comics, he was being reinvented. You know, Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams were doing fantastic work. Now, in hindsight, we look at that time and say, okay, this is where he started to turn dark. But actually, in the 1970s, did you read those comics and did you did you actually see those changes happening? Yes. Um, for me, as being a Batman fan, having come to it through the, the, the 60s stuff, and then having started to read the comic reprints, and then being able to get all the issues, I still have all my original issues of all the, the Adams O'Neill things, um, you know, uh, Batman 251, the Joker's five-way revenge and stuff. Mm-hmm. Those all are still in my possession from when I was a grade school kid. And yes, it was very, very much at the time, is you got those comics and you read those stories it, it was it was a, a a it was serious fun in the sense that this was dark film noir um incredible you know sort of drama as well as just great costume um, uh, uh, costume adventure stuff so yes for me for me it was very much at that time i was i was sucked into it from from adams o'neill and, and you know the other people uh is is a serious you know action hero a dark brooding character and that that's my love for Batman is that character uh, grew directly out of the the sixty the sixty stuff and and was was instant. You know, as I was seeing that stuff, the character became something very you know much more serious to me. What are your thoughts on the Batman cartoons that appeared in the sixties, seventies, and eighties? Obviously, we had Batman a part of seven different versions of the Super Friends. He was in a in a show that I really like, even though it is campy and for kids and whatever. I mean, I have a attack of nostalgia every now and then. But Batman with Robin, the Boy Wonder, I like that show. There's also Batman and Robin meets Scooby Doo, and then there was the New Adventures of Batman, which saw Adam West and Burt Ward this time voicing the characters so what are your thoughts on those shows that appeared during the the 60s 70s and 80s to me those are all echoes of 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 the 60s stuff with with west and ward um they are all still batman being a kitty character and uh and in kind of just just a little bit of residue uh from from the time of of of, you know the, the characters just crazy crazy mania and and because of that because of what it is it's fun uh, it, it still works on that level, but, but it, it's still silliness. It has nothing to do with with the Adams O'Neill and kind of the, the the taking the character back to his to his dark roots and stuff like that. Those those, those are still very much in, in the in the fun kitty element. The 1980s will always be remembered as the decade of Batman. We saw so many great books come out. We saw The Dark Knight Returns. We saw Batman Year One. We saw The Killing Joke. We had a really big moment, even though the story really isn't that good, but the the outcome of the story is, is still, you know, echoing all these decades later. Uh, Death in the Family. We have all these great books, and then obviously the decade ends with what people were calling at the time the movie of the decade, Tim Burton's Batman. So you were a fan of this in the '60s, the Adam West TV show. You remained a fan in the '70s through, you know, just the comic books and you know the occasional cartoon here and there. But then the '80s roll around, and you're getting all these great books, and then you get the movie at the end. What was it like in the 1980s to be paid back for your loyalty to the character? Oh man. You know, it will it will always be a moment in my life that was just so exciting. It was it was so amazing to get to see the world appreciate the character the way that, that I had always appreciated him. As I say, all my Batman stuff was hidden for years. You know, and what what ended up happening in, in the mid '80s is I was by that point I was 20. Um, I had always remained a Batman fan and, and still was reading the comics and you know with the more serious stories and stuff like that I, I had stayed stayed a fan but you couldn't really say it out loud because right. people people couldn't possibly understand what a serious Batman was about I, the, the general public could only see him as that silly kids character so it was, it was literally like you know if you were if you were saying yeah I'm a Batman fan do people would just think something wrong with you you're, you're, you're grown up that's weird what's 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 your problem so anyway it was it was so it was so sort of hidden and then first off as you mentioned um, the thing that starts to take the character 
literature to the mainstream. The comics have still been great, uh, but all, all of a sudden, with uh, um, with Batman: The Dark Knight Returns, it, it just you know creates this incredible sensation, uh, you know, that, that that moves beyond just the the comic fans. And all of a sudden, it's printed as a trade paperback. It's in regular bookstores. People are able to see the character in a different light. It's still not that many people are seeing him at that point. You don't have that many who are who are getting it, but it's getting there. And, and between that and then the killing joke, and then all of a sudden the discussion that there is going to be a, a feature film, a serious Batman feature film, and, and and all of a sudden Jack Nicholson is cast in it. You know, one of the greatest, you know, legendary, uh, you know, award-winning actors. It's like it's like all of a sudden people are sitting up and taking notice of the character in a very, very different way. So for, for me, that... Um, that sort of liberation of, of my Batman fandom was just 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 beyond thrilling at the time, and I and you know I saw I saw Batman the, the eighty nine film I saw in the theaters twenty one right. times the summer of, <laughs> right. of eighty nine. I, I lived in the movie theaters. I could not could not get enough of it. I I was very aware of it at the point of what a big deal that was. You know the the world all of a sudden saw Batman. You know everybody saw him in the same way that all of us hard core fans and seen it for so many years we were we were all on the same page you know this this seismic shift in the in the character's history had taken place and boy was it was it fun to be part of it man to to get to be there and enjoy it at that time was just just amazing we'll get to the 1989 batman film in just a second but let me let me go back a little bit so the first time you read the dark knight returns what are you thinking after reading oh man book one yeah was was just a was just jaw dropping, um, and, and and being a comic book fan, the, the whole idea of the newness of graphic novels and stuff, I was only at that point beginning to figure that out. You know, I wasn't reading anything but Batman. So so you know, you'd have the Watchmen and, and some things that were that, that were changing the, the rules of, of, of comic art, uh, but but I hadn't really seen it. So so once you had the Dark Knight Returns issue one in your hand, yeah, it was it was just like gold. It was just just absolutely shocking to take in that that book uh not only from the subject matter but just from the quality of of the art and the paper it was printed on and stuff like that yeah it, it, that that was quite you know that that was very much a revelation as well too whenever i think of dark knight returns i think of that as the last batman story i don't really need to see what happens after he you know gets the mutants and he and he has carrie kelly in that cave he fakes his death and he comes back and he plans what his next move is going to be and he stays underground and the whole world thinks that he had died like i don't need to see anything more but for some reason frank miller has gone back to that well twice i mean dark knight strikes again is very rough and i have no interest in dark knight 3 the master's race what are your thoughts on those two stories because for me i always think of batman the dark knight returns as the last batman story that's so funny you should say that that's exactly my thing it is you have the dark knight returns and 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 bruce says you know that this will be a good life good enough mm-hmm. um that it is good enough for me that's the perfect place to end it i read dark knight 2 and was just just really troubled by that i i hated the the violence and just the general cynicism and the the, the making dick grace the villain i i just despised it. in fact after buying it i can't remember how i gave my copy away I, you know i had the, the books and was like i can't even have these in my house this is just trash i don't want that um and then i haven't followed the master race at all I haven't even looked at it and i'm i'm exactly the same as you that that, that what he did with uh, um uh, what, what he did with the dark night the original was was so spectacular i just did yeah. oh we didn't even mention all-star batman and robin oh. <laughs> did that as well too um you know he's like okay i'll take on the beginning of the character and yeah i am i mean i understand why he'd go back to the well i mean people people absolutely love what he does with batman and of course you know people are just going to beg him to do more and he's going to do it through his sensibilities the character you know the character can be you know pushed and pulled and, and sort of molded any way you want so i don't at all uh fault him for doing what he's doing but it just doesn't have anything to do with the character as i see him in 1987 you could vote to see if the joker had killed jason todd robin there was a 900 number if you dial one number he lives if you dial the other number he dies did you vote and if so what did you vote for I did not vote. I found it to be completely appalling that they did that. I was was so disgusted with that, and so uh, no vote. 
vote for me, and if I had voted, it would have been to, to keep Jason alive. I just hated the whole idea of it. Um, at the time, I thought it was a, a scam. I still think it's a scam. It, it, it's like you say, it's reverberated through the years. There's there's no way we're ever getting past it uh, in terms of the, the impact it had on the character. But but to me, it was it was a cheap stunt and, and, and not a very a very cynical one at that. It's it's just cynical. I just nothing nothing that I got a kick out of. What are your thoughts about the Robin character? Because so many people go back and forth. Me, I don't like Robin and I don't dislike Robin. I, I like Batman as a lone operator. I like him better, you know, as, as just a one man war on crime. I, I like him better. But if, if Robin's in it, I don't really care. Like uh, Daniel Waters, who wrote Batman Returns, said Robin is one of the most worthless characters in the history of comics. He doesn't like him. Frank Miller, he likes Robin, but doesn't like Dick Grayson as Robin. That's obvious because of the way he's treated Dick Grayson over the years. So a lot of people go back and forth whether they like Robin or whether they don't like him. So where do you fall on it? What are your feelings Um, on Robin? I love the Robin character. I have been a Batman and Robin fan ever since, and I and I remain that, and, and I remain even a fan of, of seeing Robin solo every now and again. What I love um, is is the idea of the character being a little bit more of a, a background character, like you say. I kind of agree with your idea that he can be there, he cannot be there. The idea of him being somebody who worked with Batman as a kid, but eventually you know was going to college and is, is just a protege that can be there at times and then not be there at times is the perfect way to handle the character. The animated series did that so spectacularly. Um, a lot of the comic stories through the 70s did it that way as well, too. Uh, even up to the video games with, with the Arkham games, you know, there's Robin. He's like, I can help you. you know, let me know what you need. And Batman still kind of kind of like, uh, you know, gruff with him, like, oh, I'll let you know. Uh, he's, it, it's always like Batman almost doesn't want that partner, but, but does need him, and at times will we use him as well too. To me, to have the Robin character not by his side every second is, is a, a great way to do it. And because of that, I I, I love the character. I've, I've always been a Robin fan and will be till the day I die. Okay, now let's get into it. My favorite Batman movie of all time, 1989, Tim Burton's Batman. I still think every comic book movie that we've seen from 89 till now... Every director, every producer, every actor, some way, shape, or form, every composer, every single person that has touched a comic book character in in the modern era is still trying to channel something that happens in that movie, because that movie is just so magical. But leading up to it, there was a, a, a lot of stuff being unraveled here. There was a lot of stuff that that people had to get over before this movie could get on screen. The first thing is, the most well-documented of it all, is Michael Keaton being cast as Batman. There was no internet back then, but Tim Burton and Michael Keaton were getting mean tweets. That's how (laughs) mad everyone was about Michael Keaton being Batman. Like, what are you doing? Mr. Mom is Batman? Like, we want we want dark and serious. We want something kind of like the Killing Joe. We want stuff kind of like the Dark Knight Returns. We want that Batman. We don't want the Adam West campy TV show. What are you casting this comedian guy? Even though Michael Keaton is a very well-rounded actor, but at that time he hadn't done. I mean, he did Clean and Sober, but he really didn't do a lot of serious stuff. So people couldn't see Michael Keaton as Batman. So let's go back in time, 1987, 1988, when you find out. Michael Keaton has been cast as Batman. What's your reaction? Yeah, mine was the negative as well, too. I didn't... I wasn't such a, a, a crazed fan that I was writing letters. or I mean, there were obviously a lot of people who were doing that in the age before the Internet that were writing letters and complaining. I was somebody who was against it and thought that it was a strange call, but I didn't, I didn't actually go out of my way to fight that. And they said, as it was being done, you know, the, the studio was still saying, yes, this will be the serious Batman, even you know, with Michael Keaton. We, we know what we're doing. We're, we're going to do this. And uh, <clears throat> obviously what they did, it worked. Um, and, 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 and I still, uh, I, I love the movie. I will still say, to me, to this day, it's still a liability in terms of, of Keaton's physical presence. Mm-hmm. Sure. As, as just a shorter, more slight man, there's certain things they tried to do with the costume to make him a little bit more imposing and stuff like that. Uh, but but it does. It, I think Batman's time had come, and it wouldn't. It would have come if it was a different actor as Batman. 
I, I think I think that Nicholson is the important component in terms of com- of convincing people that seriousness. Um, of the film and the character, but uh, but Nicholson could have been a, against a lot of different actors in that in that bath suit that probably would have worked. But uh, but that said, I think I think Keaton's acting is great. I think the the movie's great. Um, I just think that physically uh, his his type is, is is not you know to me if you were going to look at Bale or Affleck or something like that, those are guys that are just perfect physically. Uh, that just just their their presence uh, is 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 a larger presence physically. You know, uh, that, that, that just I think works better for the character, but but again that's, that doesn't that doesn't uh, begin to, to to diminish my love for the film. Like I say, I saw it 21 times when it first came out. It, it was in a revival last year. I got to see my 22nd, 23rd showing in the theaters just recently. I can't even tell you how many times I've watched it on DVD and Blu-ray. It's a well that I'll never stop going back to. I love it. Uh, so so uh, Michael Keaton, I can I can still see I can. I can see the, the deficiencies that he has. The boy, it, it's not anywhere near enough to take away from just, just the, 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 the lightning strike that that film was. Before the movie had been released to theaters, they started showing a teaser trailer, a very, very rough cut of the film. I mean, there's, there's no music. The title is never even said in the movie. Just at the end of the trailer, it says, coming soon this summer or something like that. It's a very, very rough cut of film clips that are all put together in this teaser trailer. And Michael Uslan, who was one of the producers on that show and was really the guy who was spearheading this movement, he tried for 10 years to get this movie made, but he says that you know people were buying tickets to see movies that they didn't want to see just so they could see that trailer. So I'm curious in knowing, did you ever do that? Did you well, buy yeah, a ticket to a movie? He's absolutely right. That's the that's the God's honest truth. We were in South Carolina visiting my parents uh, when uh, Beaches was released, and it was one of the ones showing the, the, the original rough trailer. And we were down there on spring break. Uh, um, uh, my, my wife and I, actually at the time girlfriend, but the eventual wife, and uh, and we went to the, the movies with my mom and and I could care less about beaches. I can't even believe we sat through beaches, but it was just to see the preview. And I think, if I remember right, we got to see the preview, watch the movie, were able to maybe stay in and see the preview a second time. But but it, it, it was, and that is the moment. That that is a moment that is that is the lightning strike for me because as I saw that, I knew it was like this is happening. This is serious Batman. This is taking it to a whole different level uh, in terms of in terms of. This is taking it to the the, the Bob Kane Bill Finger character that I love. This is going to going to be something that is, that is totally totally a game changer in terms of how the world perceives Batman. It, it was it was that it, it was that big of a deal, and it was something. Uh, uh, Uslan saying that yes, that's that is the God's honest truth. I am proof of that. There were four movie tickets bought for for beaches that were just to see Batman, and we couldn't care less about beaches. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever steal a Batman poster at a bus stop? I did not, the, 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 and that, that was discussed that many posters were stolen. I actually, I wouldn't have done that because the, the big poster with just the bat symbol, I mean, that was cool, but uh, I'm, I'm a guy who visually I like to see the character and stuff like that. I, I would have preferred to see a, a poster with, with Michael Keaton in costume and stuff like that, so I, I didn't I didn't need that poster. Uh, I was I'm not guilty. I'm, I'm guilty of, of going to see the, the, uh, the, the trailer and spending money for that, but I'm not, not guilty of stealing any any posters <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's alright if you did I mean 1989 oh, I would, wasn't yeah, exactly I, I would have to fess up to you if I did <laughs> but I really didn't the, the ones that were taken out of the bus stops that was discussed but boy did I buy a lot of Batman stuff that year all the trading cards and magazines and, and yeah just the, the, the action figures and yeah it was it was truly a, a moment for uh, the, the summer of 89 was, was just just an incredible moment to be a Batman fan to get to take all that in and be there as it happened. What's your favorite part of the 1989 Batman movie? For me, it's such a toss-up. There's so many great parts. The beginning, the fake-out, I love it. You think it's going to be Bruce Wayne and you're going to see Joe Chill come out of the shadows and kill his parents, but it's really just a couple of tourists with their son. I love the you know him fighting those two thugs on rooftop. That's great. The access chemical, that 
little scene where Joker is basically born. That's a great scene. The, the Obviously, the chase, you know, where does he get all those wonderful toys? That's a great part. I have so many favorite parts of that movie, but what's your favorite part of that movie? Well, I love those three which you just mentioned. There's really four set pieces in the film that are Batman pieces. Yeah, the, the ones you just mentioned, and then also, obviously, the fi- the, the finale is there, is there, you know, up, up on top of the cathedral. And those four moments. I will say that as I saw the film in the theaters in 89, very often what I was doing, there's sort of a 45-minute lull where the character, the, the Batman character is not on the screen, so every now and again I'd be running out to get a snack or making a phone call or something mm-hmm. like that and get back in just in time as he was getting ready to, to go to the museum uh, um, in terms of uh, once he's going to rescue Vicki Vale and stuff. But those those four sequences, uh, uh, all four of them are the ones that show the character in all his glory, and, and uh, I, I love every one of them equally. I absolutely love Kim Basinger in this movie. There's only one little problem with casting her is that she's actually taller than Michael Keaton in real life, so she has to constantly be taking off her heels. I don't exactly know if that's what Tim Burton was saying in the lead up to that movie that oh well Michael Keaton is short but we can cheat the height because if you remember Sean Young was originally cast as Vicki Vale now that you know that's you know that movie has has done what it's done and it's uh, such a great movie and and Kim Basinger is so great in that movie can you imagine Sean Young playing that character? Because for me, I mean, you know, Sean Young, I mean, she's not the best looking woman in the world, but she's not ugly. Like, she's somewhere in the middle. But you can't have her go opposite of Jerry Hall in that movie. And because Joker, you know, he's obsessed with Vicki Vale. We can't have someone, you know, he's dating Jerry Hall, but then he goes after Sean Young. You can't really have that happen. So, can you imagine anyone else besides Kim Basinger playing that part? I guess I really can't, but it's kind of funny when you say that, because one funny thing about what I do with these films, with my sort of obsession with the Batman character, I almost make a point of never seeing these actors in any other films. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've, I've joked about that, that like with, with Bale, with Affleck, I've never seen any films that they're in, because I, I only wanted to know them as Batman and Bruce Wayne. Uh, and, and, and in terms of so often, you know, because I did the book on Lincoln as well, too, the joke is that if it's not a stovepipe hat or a cape and cowl, I'm probably not seeing it. Um, because of that, there's not a whole lot I've ever even seen Sean Young in. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of hard for me. It's, it's hard for me to imagine anybody but Kim Basinger. And I love the fact that you brought up the shoes, though, because that is one of the things I was proud of mentioning in the book. I thought mm-hmm. that that was right. that the Vicky loses her shoes happens three separate times in the film, and it's all strictly so she's not towering over, especially Keaton, but but Nicholson as well too. I just always found that so funny that that, that those scenes that she's you know throwing off her high heels so she can stand next. To the heroes. <laughs> and they really do it brilliantly because the one time she does it where she's walking up the steps, she's drunk, so it's well, I can't get up the stairs in these shoes because I'm wobbling all over the place. That's that's brilliant. And then then another time they do it is when they're being chased by the Joker's henchmen and she can't run in those, so she has to throw them away. So it's brilliant how they're able to do that. But one of the best one of the best scenes in the entire movie is when he fights the sword fighter guy. That that's an amazing scene, and John Peters like that, he loves talking. About, oh, you know that guy was the sword fighter guy. That was a real guy. Like he could actually really do that. Like Peters loves that scene. <laughs> I do too. That's great. And mentioning those losing the shoes, then <clears throat> the last one is almost uh, the, the best out of all <clears throat> because as um, as Vicky Vale is going up those steps yeah. in the cathedral, she loses her shoe almost like Cinderella, and, yeah. and you know the Joker kisses it and throws it down, so she loses her shoes. Again. In, a, in an almost like fairy tale type fashion. Yeah, they found they found good ways to ever lose her shoes. <laughs> what does Tim Burton's Batman do right? Oh, it does so much right in terms of getting getting the the, the feel of the character and the mysterious the nature. Uh, and, and in a way, the way they handle the origin of not really letting you know about you know the, the character, you're still kind of wondering so much of the movie. It's like how, where, you know, where did this guy come from? How did this happen? Uh, just this sort of you know skulking right off in the shadows type thing was just just so cool. Um, and obviously a fabulous Batmobile, you know, wonderful gadgets. The the costume, you know, was was, was such a cool departure even from anything in the comics and stuff, but still stayed true to looking like a comic type costume um, there's just so many things that are that are right about it uh, and I, I, that's just the start the, the whole noir aspect of the film of all the you know, villains in their kind of 40s looking suits and it's not being tied to a particular time period 
period and the the great sets and stuff like that uh, the, the, the you know the sort of sort of city teeming with menace and violence and stuff yeah it's just, just so great uh, in so many ways oh and nicholson I didn't even say him obviously yeah. nicholson as the role of the joker i mean just just a, a, a tremendous call even though he's older he's maybe not the perfect physical type for it just the fact where he was at in his career the the kind of the kind of seriousness it brought to the film was perfect Everything about that movie is great. I mean, the score, Danny Elfman's score is phenomenal. It's one of the best. I mean, it's really timeless. Like, if you would have told me, oh, you know that that score they used in Tim Burton's Batman? It's actually from an Errol Flynn movie. I would buy that because it just yeah. has that timeless, like, 1930s, 1940s type feel to it. And, and the movie, it takes place in a world kind of like the Batman animated series that really doesn't even exist like you have you have kind of 1980s stuff you have kind of 1940s stuff like it's it's just a great movie top to bottom but it still does have flaws so what does this movie get wrong well I can say I'm still uh, uh, Keaton's <clears throat> just physical presence and size is a distraction and I and I, I would pin that on Burton because Keaton was just who he was comfortable working with it was the he was going some pretty bad special effects uh, moments as, as well too, um, and it does maybe plod in, in, in some scenes. You know, to me, some of the non-costume stuff maybe could have been a little bit tightened up as well too. But still, those those things are, are nowhere near enough. Uh, the, oh, the whole discussion that actually um, that, that Batman would have revealed his identity as Bruce Wayne to the Joker in a way that still shows up in the line when when uh, Nicholson of the Joker says, oh, I was a kid when I killed your parents. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't have any way of knowing that. He doesn't right. know anything about killing uh, Bruce Wayne's parents. So the fact that, that he never does find out that, that, uh, that Bruce Wayne is Batman, there's uh, definitely some kind of story construction problems that are kind of sloppy as well, too. But all those things, you know, the, the, the negatives don't come anywhere near to, to taking away from the positives of it. Now, I read your book, so I know that you're not a fan of Batman Returns. There are a lot of flaws to this movie, but there are a lot of good Batman-type scenes. In the beginning, when he's fighting the Red Triangle circus gang, when he sets that devil on fire, I love that part. That's amazing. That devil's spitting fire, and then he turns the Batmobile around and sets him on fire. That's great. The part where Selina Kyle is being choked by that clown, and Batman misses, and the guy's like, ha ha, you missed, and then he pulls that wall, and he knocks him out. Like There is a lot of stuff to work with in this. You know, when he goes through the Oswald Cobblepot School of Driving, I love that part as well. So I know you're not a fan of this movie, but what does this movie do right? Well, and yeah, some of those scenes you mentioned are cool, and certainly the uh, the big fight scene between Batman and Catwoman is, is awesome. I mean, that, that's a really amazing set piece in, in that film. So yeah, there, there's certainly great Batman moments in there. My biggest problem is just the overall feeling of despair of that film, and the idea that Batman is made into just cold-blooded killer is what bothers me so much. To me, that runs counter to the time-honored tradition of, of the character. Um, and, and also the fact that they didn't incorporate everything that was so great about the 89 film with the sets and the more expansive feel of Gotham City and stuff. Burton didn't want to do that again, so filmed on a soundstage in, in, uh, uh, in, in Los Angeles. And just everything about Gotham feels like it takes place inside a snow globe. It's just very, very small and doesn't give you the same kind of the same kind of room to just sort of stretch out and you know, have it be a little bit more epic and stuff uh, that, like the 89 film did. That's what bothers me a lot about the 92 film, that it just feels very, very cramped. I know that it wasn't in the original script and they planned on not using it, but can you imagine the ending of the film without Catwoman reappearing? It seems like the obvious thing to do at the end of the movie because cats have nine lives and she only loses, I believe, eight of them. It seems like that should have always been in the final film. So can you imagine not having that scene at the end? Yeah, to me, setting that up makes perfect sense. But my, my memory is, I think, that Daniel Waters, his original script, he, they were going to kill her a yeah. lot like they did with the Joker, that mm-hmm. she would have been killed off completely. But yes, having the, the Catwoman character go on makes makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree that that's the way it should have been handled. But the, the film is so crowded in the sense that I think Burton is just far more interested in the Catwoman, the Penguin, mm-hmm. the Max Shrek characters. He, 
he actually, Batman is, is really sort of forced into the back in his own movie. I, I just think, I think he just went out of his way to not repeat the success of, of the 89 film, which is, of course, very funny because most films are, you know, when you have a sequel, they're kind of cookie cutters. They try and make the same film. And uh, Burton very much went to try and make a very different film. But to me, I, if he had if he'd kept some of the elements of, of the first film, it would have just made more sense and, and, and made it better. But I like to say, to me, his overriding themes of just despair and sort of, you know, urban isolation and stuff in that film, to me, that's not, not it, 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 it's not about Batman. It's more he had a different message he wanted to, to give. What are your thoughts about Christopher Walken? Because obviously, you know, he's a great actor, but in this role, he really doesn't fit into it because, you know, we have the, the bat, the cat, the penguin. We have all these colorful characters running around Gotham City. Max Shrek is supposed to be like the guy who, in the public, he's this perfect guy, and then behind the scenes, he's a crook. But you can't have Christopher Walken be that guy. Like, he's this over the top performer. He's supposed to be like just this, like, normal guy. And then when you cast Christopher Walken as Max Shrek, it kind of ruins the effect. So, what are your thoughts about having him as Max Shrek? Yeah, and to me, the character in general is just. just- too much. It's, it's, it's just piling on when you already had the Catwoman and the Penguin and two you know, fabulous uh, villains to, to use for the film to actually then uh, try and shoehorn in another third villain and even though he's not costumed, he's still played kind of broad. Uh, yeah, to, to me, that's it's just too much and, and everything about it is the focus of the, the, the film is not on uh, Batman and it, to me, it, it should have been a Batman film. It, it was much more a film about, about the other characters than it was about Batman. You've touched on several key things that are wrong with this movie, and another thing is the the whole thing about Penguin's whole deal. Like he, he's he's trying to be mayor, but he's also got this secret plot. Like there is way too much going on in this movie, and we're running out of time with everyone. Like everyone doesn't get their proper due in this movie. Even the people that Burton is obsessed with, like Catwoman, like even her character isn't fully flushed out. I think there's a little bit more there. There's a little bit more with Penguin, a lot more with Batman. Like we just don't have enough time. So besides everything that you already mentioned, what else does this movie get wrong? Well, yeah, in, in terms of in terms of the just this, the general silliness of the story um, of just way too much and, and way too you know uh, what these penguins are somehow going to bomb the entire city or, or the idea of rounding up every firstborn mm-hmm. it, it, it plays like some sort of weird fairy tale oh and you're rounding up every firstborn in a like crazy circus train that's going through you know a, a cop stops that and stop it in one second it just has it, it, it is it is all taking place in, in Burton's uh, in my opinion rather disjointed mind uh, it, it doesn't have any sort of logic logic is, is what so often makes the Batman character so wonderful because he can be based in the real world and keeping the character more logical to me is what what is so fabulous about him and Burton he, he, there's there's no place for logic in that film <laughs> not even not even at one moment do we have any logic so that that's that's what bothers me so much did you always not like this movie or as the years have gone on and as you've studied the film more closely that's when it starts to unravel for you oh no I can I, that's another great story I uh I, being the Batman you know just fanatic that I was as the film came out I can't remember the exact date it was released my firstborn son born on uh June 16th 1992 <laughs> Taylor actually that was a huge Batman fan himself uh coming home from the hospital I think him coming home was the night of the premiere that we had bought tickets for that I was going out. It might have been the second night. I think I think actually Taylor came home and then we had tickets the next the next night for the midnight showing. And my memory is we're home with our newborn baby. The hot water heater broke and we didn't have any hot water and I was leaving to go see Batman Returns. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, Jill. Jill, my wife was not, not too thrilled with me that night. But I had tickets. I was going to see it with people. And then going and being so excited about it and seeing it and being instantly let down just destroyed by it the, the very first showing it, it didn't it didn't take uh, any time for me to just be so so disappointed in it it was it was that moment that it just hit me 
mean, I did see it a number of times in the mm-hmm. theater, but I've never grown to like it. And it just is simply, it is not the Batman character as I know and appreciate him. Just as, as simple as that, the, the killing scenes, the, the lack of logic, um, it just it's just not Batman as, as I know him. And again, as I say, it, it's it, Batman can be any way that the people want him to be. He's a fictional character. He, he can be molded any any way, shape, or form. But but it just isn't a character that jives with the time honored traditions. Uh, he's not a character that, j- that jives with time honored traditions in that film. Uh, to me, the the the, the long standing history of the character is not is not respected in that film. Sam Hamm's script, the man who wrote the first Tim Burton Batman movie, his script follows. Catwoman and Penguin searching for a lost treasure. Would this storyline have made any difference to you, or do you think that with Burton doing what he was doing, regardless of what the plot is, it still would have been jumbled and not really Yeah, I've read that script, and to me, just where they were going, whatever they were going to take, they were trying desperately to to distance themselves from 89. I think that Burton felt like he they sort of held his hand, made him color inside the lines Mm -hmm. on the 89 film, and he was just absolutely convinced, I'm going to do this one my way, and it's not going to be the the studio is not going to to force me into a certain box in this. So yeah, I think whatever story you were getting, um, whichever script it would have been, you would have had Burton pushing the envelope um, and, and, and fighting back against the, the, the system. And, uh, I, 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 so yeah, that, I've seen that script, but no, I don't think it would have made any difference to me either way. After Batman Returns, we get Batman the Animated Series. What's your favorite episode of that show? Oh man, there's so much to talk about with the animated series. My favorite episode of Batman the Animated Series is probably the two-part Robin's Reckoning. Um, that was a great, almost like a movie in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the discussion of, of Batman first uh, bringing Dick Grayson into his life after Dick Grayson's care, uh, after his uh, parents were killed and stuff. Um, and that this whole episode in general is, is is such a great kind of examination of the relationship between Batman and Robin. Like I say, that the Robin character really works for me when he's when he's somebody who's a little bit more of a utility player uh, with, with Batman, and I just think they did such a good job with that. And there's also a lot of sort of old school uh, Batman stuff, like when when he just first started fighting crime in there. It's, it's a it's a really cool uh, story arc. There's so many I could I could probably name another half dozen others right off the top of my head, but Robin's Reckoning I think is my absolute favorite. Many people say that this is the the quintessential Batman. This is the best version of Batman, what we saw on the animated series. This is how the character was meant to be. Do you believe that? Would you yeah. co-sign that? I do. I do 100%. What I think is so wonderful about it, uh, not only the fact that they drew so much on all of the different elements of the Batman character and all these great stories over the years, but the fact that a series like that allows the examination of the character to be episodic, to, 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 to be, you know, one episode can be really dramatic and can be, you know, like a world-ending crisis. Another episode can be much more intimate. Uh, one can be funny. Um, uh, you know, one can be uh, about a much smaller crime and, and, and so forth. The, the, the different stories that can be told... Um, I'm reminded a lot of like Star Trek, especially Star Trek Next Generation. They had an incredible amount of time, you know, in episodes when they could explore and do so many different things. The problems with with the films, like the Batman films and stuff, and really all these superhero films, so often it's always like it's a cataclysmic end of the world event. Mm-hmm. Like everything has to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it doesn't allow you to explore these characters in a way that can actually be far more detailed and intimate. Now, in 1993, we got Batman, The Mask of the Phantasm. Originally, it was just supposed to be released on VHS, and that was just what it was supposed to be. But then, at the last minute, they changed it, and they decided to release it in theaters around Christmas time. So, number one, when you went and saw it in the theaters, what was your initial reaction? And number two... Is it possible that this could be the greatest Batman movie ever made? Because a lot of people feel that way. Um, yeah, I did get to see it in the theaters, and that was a really cool thing. Uh, it literally only played for a week. It, right. it, it was, it was, it came and gone. It, it came and went so fast. It didn't really get a chance to make any sort of an impression. 
passion in the theaters, and you had to really be a serious Batman fan to even seek it out. I remember it, it actually opened on Christmas Day 93, and I think by New Year's it was out. Um, I still managed to see it in the theaters three times, so I did get to enjoy it as a theatrical release. Um, and at the time, to me, it was an enormous relief after what I considered to be sort of a, the disappointment of, uh, of Batman Returns to get something that was sort of a return to form. It was cool to see it that way. Um, the best Batman movie ever. I, I would still not feel that way, and, and my biggest reason for that would be that the story, the way it shoehorns the Joker into the third act, um, it, it's a great movie, but it, I think, again, it gets a little bit ambitious trying to take on too much, and it almost just feels stuffed, and, and, and like the story can't really breathe um, properly by, by the time you get to the end. With what you've done with the Phantasm character, then all of a sudden trying to pile your Batman's greatest nemesis into it as well, too, to me makes it just a little bit tough to, to uh, have the whole thing play out in a, in a natural fashion. But even still, that said, I, I love it, but I don't consider it to be, be the best. I, I, I do think... The idea of the character is portrayed in the entire animated series vein okay. as being maybe the definitive version of the character is, is true, but 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 actually, Mask of the Phantasm being the definitive movie, I don't I don't feel it it gets quite there. Leading up to the release of this movie, there was a controversy surrounding it because Kenner released an action figure of the Phantasm, but it was a half Andrea Beaumont, half Phantasm figure, and when they put it in stores, and the packaging has the Andrea Beaumont, uh, the figure exposed, so when you would go to the store, like a Toys R Us, and see it, you would know that she was the Phantasm. Were you aware of <laughs> yeah, this the at the time? already given away right there in just yeah. that one toy. <laughs> yeah. Were you aware of this at the time? I don't remember thinking about it at the time. My biggest thing that I remember <clears throat> is being a little bit confused because the Phantasm character was so much like the character of the Reaper right. who was in Batman mm -hmm. Year Two. Right. And I remember seeing the original poster and saying, well, that's the Reaper. I know that character. So mm -hmm. I felt like I already knew where where they were going with the character and then finding out that I was completely wrong, that it actually was a completely different character. But boy, they they are basically almost the exact same. Uh, and even some of the some of the elements of origins and stuff are a little bit similar as well too so, so yeah that <clears throat> that was the thing that really had struck me I don't remember thinking too much about uh, uh, about the Andrea character as, you know, being being the, the main villain that that was given away oh one other thing I think is worth mentioning too um a big part of that film is is the scene when when Batman uh, is, is is wanted by the police, right. kind of trying to escape from the uh, um, uh, from the the building that's half built and stuff like that. That and some of the opening scenes when they first start talking about Bruce becoming Batman are very similar to Batman Year One. That's one of the things that we've not talked about. Something I think in terms of Frank Miller's work mm -hmm. and just Batman stories that is so essential. Out of everything we've gone through, that was one that we didn't get a chance to mention before, but, but the stuff that happens in, in Mask of the Tan Phantasm is, is very much taken from, from the vibe of, of year one, and I, I think that that's a great part of the film as well, too. I wasn't old enough to see this when it was brand new. I was maybe like five or six months old when, when this was released, so I, I had seen it later in time, but when I finally did see the movie for the first time, I never thought that they were setting it up so that Carl Beaumont would be the phantasm. I always thought it was going to be her. Like I for some reason, I don't know what it is about this movie, but I never didn't see that coming. Just the way they set it up, it really didn't seem like it was going to be anyone but her. How, how do you feel about this? I, I feel that way, too. I, and it's so it's so long ago, and having seen it in the theaters and having lived with it for so long, I don't have a good sense of what my first impressions were in terms of that being a, a reveal or a plot twist that was, you know, a surprise. I, I just, and, and maybe, maybe I actually knew about the toy stuff that you're talking about and knew it was going to be her all along, I, I I just I have no no memory of that. I don't have any memory of ever being surprised by by Andrea you know, being the main villain at the time from the very first showing, and it still sticks with me. I thought it was such an, an a loose end in terms of what was happening that she could sort of appear and disappear at will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the smoke, and then all of a sudden she's there, she's gone, and 
none of that was ever explained in terms of like how is the character even doing right. any of these things there's no <laughs> like a scooby doo type of reveal or something oh well look they had a had a you know a little hovercraft they were flying on or something like that I, it never made any sense to me in terms of exactly how is this character appearing and disappearing at will and, and you know how is how is batman not able to to stop her that that, that that's the main thought i remember having, having about the phantasm character at the time not not that it was uh, andrea one of my favorite things about this movie is it gives us a different take on the origin but also leaves intact everything that we have known and loved about batman's origin and it just adds a little bit too they don't reinvent the wheel so i like that but the second part that i like the most about this movie and something that i thought they dropped the ball with in batman begins was is when batman goes before he's batman he's just wearing a ski mask and he fights those thugs and then he realizes yeah i did a good job i foiled the robbery i beat these guys up but i i didn't strike fear into their hearts i have to do something different and then we see a young Bullock. Like that's a really great scene. So there, there is a lot of good stuff to work with. But let's start with this. What, what does this movie do good? Yeah, and I like what you're saying about the idea of the origin, and that that is so drawn from Batman Year One. Mm-hmm. The idea that that Bruce in a ski mask trying to figure out a way to fight criminals outside of the mm-hmm. the, the you know regular justice system. Um, uh, that's what happens within Mask of the Phantasm, <clears throat> and that that is very much what happens in Year One. That he's like they, they didn't fear me. You know, I'm just a guy in a ski mask. What can I do to to ramp this up? Mm-hmm. So I think that that's such a neat part of the movie. Um, and then, oh, let's see, beyond that, what else do I love about Mask of the Phantasm? Uh, just, boy, I, th- I think the, the biggest thing for me is the pleasure of getting to see the character, uh, the, you know, it, from the animated series, the TV show expanded into this big, big image of, of you know, a, a movie version of that. Because it really is just a supersized no. um, episode. And to me, that's a great thing, because the episodes were so great to supersize it is, is, is even better. Um, the fact that it can play a little bit darker since it was an actual movie release mm-hmm. as opposed to um, as opposed to uh, the the TV show, I think I think helps it as well too. So yeah, to me to me all those things make it really great because it's a great thoughtful uh, examination of Batman's you know, formative years of you know, becoming Batman and and uh, and just being able to to stretch out a little bit more in terms of content and and, and scenes. Besides what you already mentioned, what else does this movie get wrong? Well, yeah, like I say, the, the idea of the Joker being shoehorned in is a little bit tough. I mean, it's great to have him in there, but since it it, it makes the, the story just feel a little bit crammed, and then just also the idea of just the general uh, phantasm being a bit of a retread and not really being able to tell exactly who she is or where she's from uh, is, is, is just uncomfortable. Um, so, but, but this, those are the only things that really bothered me about it. Oh, and in terms of when you say what else do you like, one thing I should mention, I think the final uh, scene when you have Batman and Alfred talking, mm-hmm. um, and Alfred is, is telling him, you know, you've walked this, this, you know, next to this abyss and you've never mm-hmm. fallen in, I'm so proud of you for that. Um, that to me is one of the coolest uh, Batman scenes in any screen work. That was just such an amazing way to, to sort of close out that study and stuff. It's great that you brought that up, and I'm going to reply to that when we talk about Dark Knight Rises. So I, I, I'm very happy that you brought that up, but I'm going to save my comment off of that when we get to Dark Knight Rises. But, oh, cool. Okay. Okay. So anyways, we get Batman Animated Series going. It's a very popular show. We have Mask of Phantasm. Batman is going to return to the big screen in live action with Batman Forever. Now, Tim Burton is out as the director there's a plethora of reasons why he's no longer going to be the director. They have him shoved away as a producer. They replace him with Joel Schumacher. Now, before we get to the actual Batman Forever movie, a lot of different things have happened. Michael Keaton is no longer going to be Batman. He's replaced with Val Kilmer. Tommy Lee Jones is now Two-Face. It was being set up that Billy D. Williams, who had played Harvey Dent in Tim Burton's Batman in 1989, he would eventually become Two-Face, a lot of people thought. So let's start there. Billy D. Williams as Two-Face. Are you sad that he didn't get to play that part, or are you okay with him not being Two-Face? 
I was okay with it. To me, the the whole thing was such a, a complete reboot when it really came down to it. Mm-hmm. In some ways, the fact that they maintain any connections to the the first two films was kind of strange. I mean, the fact that everything is completely different except for the actors that play uh, Commissioner Gordon and Alfred. In a way, it's like, well, why not just start the whole darn thing over mm-hmm. again? Um, you know, even if you make some references to the uh, to the other movies, but but have new actors just across the board. So no, I wasn't. <coughs> I wasn't particularly bothered by that, and I thought I, I don't. Tommy Lee Jones being a deadpan actor seems like kind of an odd choice for <laughs> Two Face to begin with, but uh, but it, it worked well enough. That, that that didn't bother me. I mean, everything the hype surrounding Forever in terms of the different actors they had and the in the, the sort of fresh mindset they had. Um, Schumacher is obviously going to get the worst rap in the world among <laughs> Batman fans after he after he does Batman and Robin, but I still maintain that with in Batman Forever, there's there's plenty to like. I, I I do not hate it. I think it's it's starting to show the warning signs of the return to sort of crazy campiness and mm-hmm. you know sort of wink wink silliness and stuff. But uh, but there's still a lot within the movie that I, I still enjoy. And the fact that you finally get to see uh, Robin come in to uh, come into play as a as a character, you know, since I am a Robin fan, I was excited about that at the time as well. I I, I that one quite a few times in the theaters and, and very much enjoyed it and it felt like it was a step in the right direction after after uh, returns. There's been the rumor for as long as I can remember of Robin Williams actually being cast as the Joker so that the studio could leverage Jack Nicholson into coming on board and being the Joker. There's the, I don't maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. I don't know, but that I've heard that a bunch, and you know, on the internet, anything can be written there. So who knows? But I've heard that. Then I've also heard that he was actually going to be the Riddler because when Tim Burton was still attached to the project, Robin Williams was his first choice for the Riddler. So are you sad that Robin Williams wasn't the Riddler, or are you okay with Jim Carrey being the Riddler? Oh, I was okay with. Carrey. Um, to me, Robin Williams is maybe a little bit more. I, I think you could have Jim Carrey disappear into the role, even though he'd become a, a star by that point. He, right. he he definitely was still able to to play the part in a way that didn't you know. You know, uh, Robin Williams tends to he he was somebody who could just take over most anything that he did. He was just so manic. You know, not that he wasn't great, but it just was somebody that did the bigness of his personality so often could overwhelm a role. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually thought I thought Carrie did a good job. I remember um, I think it was an interview in Premiere Magazine before the film came out that his comments in terms of about all the characters and about Batman made me feel like he gets this more. He's more thoughtful about this mm-hmm. than I remember Val Kilmer's comments were very very glib. He's like, oh, "It's just a gig. I don't yeah. care." But uh, but but it, as I read what Jim Carrey was saying, I was like, "I think he gets this and is actually sort of appreciating the the tradition of the characters and stuff like that." So yeah, I don't. I was I was never sorry that, that, that he was the one who ended up with the role. The original plan for Batman Returns was to introduce Robin, but. Of course, with so many characters being in that movie, Robin had to be pushed to Batman Forever. But originally, Marlon Wayans was supposed to be Robin. Now, that could have been very interesting to see. Hindsight looking back, I wonder what they would have done with him. But Marlon Wayans is Robin. Any interest there? Oh, yeah. That, to me, is fascinating because in terms of the idea of what that might have been, um, the toys that were released for, right. uh, um, for Batman Returns, I yep. think it would have been Kenner at that point. Yes. I think it was Kenner yes. Toys yep. had, Kenner. The, had the licensing. Mm-hmm. But, but the actual um, uh, licensed Batman Returns figures, there is a Robin figure. Mm-hmm. And it is, it is a, a kid with kind of a flat top yeah. haircut. And you can tell that, that that is a sculpt that they probably did, thinking that that would be uh, the Marlon Wayans Robin. So the idea that the character was actually within the uh, within all the toy and merchandising and, and uh, uh, well, I guess really just the toys, not so much merchandising, but then never showed up. I remember it was very confusing. It's like, well, wait, Robin's right here. Why isn't Robin yeah. within the movie? So that that to me is still the clearest uh, uh, view of what the Returns would have looked like with with a with a Robin in it. Uh, and that's <laughs> and all my Batman stuff. That's still something that, that sits in my showcase very often yeah. as I walk by and look. I was like, man, that's just crazy to think about what that what that would have been like. There's that Robin that, that never was, um, but uh, but it, they finally did since they didn't get it done for that movie. I think that, that for uh, um, for Schumacher, that was probably the studio's you know number one directive, Robin. 
development is happening big time in this movie. This is this character is going to be a major part of this uh, part of this film. And I think Chris O'Donnell. I think that that was. I think he was a a great choice, and that was that was a, a cool way to present the character. Tim Burton's version of Batman Forever. Is this a missed opportunity? Would you have liked to see what he would have done with these characters as opposed to Schumacher? No, no, for me not at all because because uh, Burton was so done with it. He had mm-hmm. no interest in playing the game in terms of making... Mm-hmm. Uh, here's the thing, and I guess maybe this is a, a big thing to point out. For me, a Batman film that can stay on, on the side of PG-13 and stay somewhere that, that kids you know, who are 8 or 10 years old can still see it without it being mm-hmm. too terribly objectionable, uh, I, I think Batman should play to all ages. Right. I think that the animated the series shows that it can be something the kids can see, but still has some real emotional depth and, and power uh, for adult viewers as well, too. Um, so uh, the fact that Burton did not want to do that, that he went so far out of his way to uh, to, to make returns inaccessible for, for sort of good-time movie audiences and certainly for kids and stuff like that, makes me just, uh, yeah, I, I was so glad to, to see him gone. And I felt like if Schumacher came in, he knew what his job was. Let's make a Batman film that can be that can be a little bit lighter fare that, that you know all ages can enjoy and stuff like that. So from from that standpoint, that the movie to me was was a success. I don't love everything about it, but but the fact that it took the characters and and, and put them in a way that, that you could take a ten year old to see the film uh, to me was was a good thing. I really like Batman Forever. I know a lot of people hate it. I know a lot of people say that it's the return of camp, even though Batman and Robin truly is the return to the 1966 Batman TV series. But there's a lot to love in Batman Forever. Unfortunately, arguably the best scene in the entire movie is a deleted scene when Bruce Wayne goes to the Batcave and that big giant bat comes up and it's revealed in his father's journal that they wanted to stay in but Bruce wanted to go out and and that was the night that his parents were killed like that's a great scene even though it's not in the the real movie and then there's the a uh, uh, great scene in the movie where where Batman's buried alive and Robin has to come in and save him I, I thought that was a great scene and really the last 35 minutes of the movie are the strongest because you know we get Riddler, Jim Carrey, basically doing himself. He, he's fantastic when he's de- destroying the Batcave. And then we get the suits, you know, the, the new Bat suit, which is one of my all time favorites, actually, the, the prototype suit. And then we have the, when he throws those coins up, kind of like in Batman the Animated Series, how, how in part two of Two Face, he, he does the same thing. Although in your book, uh, he he does it a little bit too well, as you put it. When when Two Face goes to to his end, and and really the when when they run off at the end of the movie is is really strong too. The last scene where where Batman says goodbye to Chase Meridian, and then we see Batman and Robin run out. Like there's a lot to love in this movie, even though there is a lot of stuff that's that's very rough at, at certain points. So what does Batman Forever do right? Yeah. All those things you mentioned, I agree with every one of those to a T. And and uh, and the the idea of getting to see Batman and Robin t- together, mm-hmm. you know, in 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 this this new sort of more serious way of looking at the characters and stuff was so cool. You've got a great Robin origin. You've got Arkham Asylum on screen mm-hmm. for the first time, uh, and you've you've got uh, the characters in, in terms of especially uh, uh, the Riddler, uh, you know, brought to life in a way that's similar to the Garish uh, uh, 60s show, but but somehow, it, it, even though it, it is a little bit campy and Garish, that character is. He should be he should be kind of fun and bright and loud and stuff like that. It just it just works that way. So all those things are a positive. And as you as you mentioned, um, some of the deleted scenes that that, uh, that would have made it maybe even a, a stronger film or at least a more thoughtful film. We did have those cut. Um, and, and a lot of that was was also bringing emotional depth to the character. And uh, by far, one of the biggest things for me was the fact that Batman Returns had had Batman as, as a killer. You know, literally, um, you know, murdering some of the some of the uh, villains he was fighting. This time around, we went to the exact opposite of that and, and tried to show Batman as a as a character of of justice as opposed to to just straight out 
you know, mm-hmm. anger and vengeance and stuff, and him trying to say it's got to be about more than vengeance. Uh, and that, and that was a, a big part of the film that I, I feel like was almost an apology for mm-hmm. for uh, Batman Returns in, in terms of, of you know a lot of the bloodthirstiness of that film. What exactly is Tommy Lee Jones doing in this movie? Because at certain points, he's the two-face that we all know and love. He is vicious at times in this movie, but then he goes all Joker mode on us, and he's laughing, and he's doing all this stuff, and, and really, I see him being criticized very heavy in this movie from, from fans. I never really noticed what he was doing, because I was always more interested in Batman and Robin and, and interested in Jim Carrey, because I'm a huge Jim Carrey fan, so I kind of forgot it about Tommy Lee Jones because to me he was always that guy from Lonesome Dove like he never he never like made an impact for me then when I started to see the online criticism of him I started to study him more and and he's just doing stuff that he shouldn't be doing so what exactly do you think he's going for here he does seem to be just throwing stuff on a wall and trying yeah. to see what sticks. Uh, everything about it seems that very much like he's casting about, not quite sure what he's supposed to do with the role. Mm-hmm. Um, and and as great as the, the character had been portrayed in the animated series, um, they just didn't get anything of that. It, it, yes, it, it's very odd. Uh, you do get the feeling like at times he's trying to play broad, and then there's a few lines where he's where he says like have the good taste, like that's his. Uh, um, you know, posh, you know, nice side, and he's like, to die. I'm like, oh, you're getting the yin and the yang here, but but it doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't, it doesn't come across right at all, and because he is sort of a sort of a more deadpan actor, it just didn't, it just didn't really work. And plus, you know, it's kind of goofy to say, but in terms of the the, you know, he's supposed to be a young, handsome guy who's yeah. half scarred and stuff, but, but Tommy Lee Jones in real life is a guy that's actually kind of a, a rough-looking, pockmarked face guy, right. so it was hard to even, you know, try and get a good side on him in some ways. To me, he, he just is a, is a rough-hewn actor, and again, I don't mean that offensively, that's just who he is, and in a lot of ways that works, but, mm-hmm. but it, just, it just didn't work in this film, and I think he, uh, all the stories are that he hated it just more than anything. Mm-hmm. If you're a Carey fan, I'm sure you probably heard uh, Jim Carrey talk about the fact that you know, like, it, sometime off the set, Carey went up to to uh, <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones, and Tommy Lee Jones is like, "I hate you. I hate everything about you. I don't want to be doing this film with you. Yeah. I despise you." I mean, he just just completely. I, I I think I think he just hated being involved with this. And that's what Schumacher says. I think that Schumacher eventually discussed the the difficulties with both Kilmer and with Tommy Lee Jones, that they were real uh, prima donnas during the making of the film. Now for the moment I guess everyone's been waiting for since we've been hyping up this movie and telling everyone how good it is. What does Batman Forever get wrong? Because in a lot of people's opinions, it's more like what does the film get right? Because a lot of people don't like this. So what does it do wrong? Oh, and you just need four. Nipples on the bat suit. I mean, that's so goofy. Why are there nipples on the bat suit? Come on. And it's just ridiculous. Supposedly Bob Kane was on set. It's like, why the hell did they put nipples on the bat suit? Um, but I, that's maybe just a metaphor for everything that's right. just a little bit over the top and needless about it. I suppose uh, there's just a number of things. When you have the Batmobile driving up the wall, when you have all the garish, you know, day glow colors, and it, it does just the eventually get to be too much, you know, where, where all of a sudden it's getting camped up and just generally ramped up in, in, in a sort of illogical, silly, cartoonish way. It's just too much. There are a few moments in the film where you even get, like, cartoon sounds of somebody's being hit or something right. like that. Um, it, there's, there's no doubt that Schumacher was trying to push it in a way that was far more broad and far more like the like the 60s Batman. And, and he's, his camping, it, it's it's not destroying uh, forever uh, like it like it would Batman and Robin, but it's certainly it's certainly worrisome. It's starting to head in a direction that just doesn't feel doesn't feel right. Doesn't doesn't feel like the the new oh I, I should say the old Batman. The idea of the great you know dark creature of the night from from Kane and Finger that has eventually been resurrected in these films, starting with the '89 film. Uh, uh, Batman is now a more serious character, and all of a sudden you've got Batman forever trying to turn him back silly again. 
Now, I haven't seen very many Joel Schumacher films. I've seen, obviously, Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, and I've seen Phone Booth. But besides those movies, I haven't really seen much of his work. But from what I know about him, he seems like he's like a studio's director. Like, whatever they tell him to do, he'll do. Like, all right, this is the vision we have. Now we got to go find someone to do it, and then we'll bring him in. Whereas other directors are, well, we have this character, but we don't know what to do with him. Let's give him to director X, and then they can play with him and, and bring him to life. Schumacher seems like the kind of guy who was just doing what the studio was telling him. He's undisputed the, the number one most hated man in the Batman universe, but does he deserve it? Probably. <laughs> I, you know, when it comes down to it, with, with Batman Forever, I think you're right. I think he was very much a company man, and he took that in the direction that he thought the studios wanted and that he thought the public would, would enjoy. And I think he was successful. It grossed, it, it, it grossed more than, than uh, uh, Batman Returns. Uh, it, it did well, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and a lot of things about it, to me, still please a long-time Batman fan. There's a lot of things that still fall within the time-honored traditions of the character. So from that standpoint, it works. One thing I didn't say when you were talking about things that were wrong with the mm-hmm. film, um, the, the general uh, starting to, to get beyond the, the, the real world in terms of gravity and, and, and actual physics and stuff like that, the people are jumping off buildings from the top and being able to land without hurting themselves again, like a, you know, like a Roadrunner cartoon mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, well, and again, I should say, I guess, that the coyote always did get hit but, or get killed, but a lot of the characters don't end up being hurt when they're jumping off buildings and stuff. That, to me, is the, the, the type of stuff where all of a sudden you get it. It's like, well, what's going on? Batman's a real character. That that stuff shouldn't be happening. You know, physics physics and logic should should play a much bigger role in a Batman movie. But anyway, that's, that's something where, to me, Schumacher was starting to turn that way. But being the company man that he was, to me, he did produce the movie that that, that he thought the studios, he thought the public wanted with Batman Forever. What, to me, happens is then, with Batman and Robin, then he he runs wild. He thinks, oh my God, this is work. Mm-hmm. So I'm not only gonna gonna you know try and you know stick to the the format, try and stick to the blueprint I've already established, but I'm gonna actually make it even wilder and, and, and do it my way and Schumacher it up. And that's that's when all of a sudden he becomes the, you know one of the most hated guys in in Batman history because of because of what he does in in, in uh, Batman and Robin. If he had stopped after uh, Batman Forever, we might might have a have a very very different opinion about him. Mm-hmm. It, it's really all about the atrocity that was Batman and Robin that, that just got got him, you know, so blacklisted. I really can't say anything good about Batman and Robin, and, I, and I'm a positive guy, and I'm I'm trying to th- say something. I'm trying to think of something, but I I just can't do it. There's there's really nothing there to work with. But my question to you is because obviously now we've had this attack of nostalgia and. The Batman 1966 TV series is popular again. You know, there's so much... I mean, Batmania in the 60s, there was a ton of merchandise on the market, but now we have just as much merchandise from that show on the market now as it was back in the 60s. So many people are fans of that show. There was a comic book. There, There's those... Well, there, well we, we had one direct-to-DVD Blu-ray animated movie, and then we're getting another one, Batman vs. Two-Face, so we have a bunch of new Batman 66 merchandise and films, and everyone's a fan of the show again. So why didn't Batman and Robin work? Like, if, if people go back to the 66 show and still enjoy it, why wouldn't they enjoy this? I'm curious. Well, it's it's interesting to me, I, I guess, the thing, you know, it, it, my anger at, at Schumacher eventually gave way to sort of a bewilderment. It's like, how did we end up here? He didn't go out of his way to make the most reviled movie of all time. Right. He didn't hate the Batman character and say, oh, I'm going to destroy this. Um, so how did it happen? Um and I guess what I would say, uh, what I said in the book, and I guess I still feel this way, is that 
since Batman had been brought back to the public in a way that was as a serious, mm-hmm. you know, darker character, an action hero, you know, that, that was was not campy, that, that was actually, you know, what was was actually something that did have more emotional depth to it. People like that, and they didn't want to go back. Um, the, 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 the campiness of the 60s and just the campiness of the character in general was from a time that was fun and nostalgic, but we were at a point now where, where it's kind of awesome in the fact that, that the public wouldn't settle for, for anything less than a, than a serious, a more serious Batman. To me, that's what happened with Batman and Robin. The people had been, had been shown a much cooler version of the character, and they were like, we like this cool version. We're not, we're not, you know, taking in this nonsense here. That, that to me is why. Now, in terms of nostalgia, why it still works with the 60s, maybe because it just is the 60s. Maybe because of, um, because it's that long ago and what it meant in the 60s and, and just everything that the country and the world went through and pop art and great 60s music and all that nostalgia from that time and somehow still works. But, uh, well, and usually nostalgia does come uh, for something that, that was successful. Mm-hmm. And here, you know, obviously Batman in the 60s was, was tremendously successful. Batman and Robin was a, was a massive failure. Normally, you don't get a, a ton of nostalgia for things that are just god awful, you know. And who knows? Maybe we still get that kind of like Plan Nine from Outer Space, the you know, one of the worst films of all time. You just go to showings of it to to laugh yeah. at it. Even the serials were that way. Yeah. You know, they were only modestly successful at the time, and eventually people were watching it because it was just uh, so silly. You know, it was unintentionally funny. Maybe that's what happens with Batman and Robin. But but yeah, there there. I think there still are. Some some Batman fans out there that would say, hey, that was one of my favorites. I like that one. But obviously there's almost there's so few of those. You know, most people, most Batman fans fall on our side. They're just mm-hmm. like, no, that's not not acceptable. One thing I find very fascinating about the Joel Schumacher movies is not only do they try to channel the 1966 TV series, but they also try to channel the business model because Look at the stars that are appearing. You know, on the 66 TV series, you know, Cesar Romero and, and all these villains, they were very popular. These, you know, Hollywood legends. And then they had the people like Sammy Davis Jr. and all these other people who were, you know, making cameo appearances on the show. Like, really, really famous people. Now we get these movies and we have, you know, at the time, Jim Carrey was really hot. You know, he was oh, just yeah. coming off of Ace Ventura and Dumb and Dumber and The Mask. And then we have Val Kilmer. He was Doc Holliday and Tombstone, he, he was hot at the time. Nicole Kidman, Chris O'Donnell, he was coming off of The Three Musketeers. Tommy Lee Jones was popular. Arnold Schwarzenegger was popular. George Clooney was from ER. Uma Thurman, I'm not a really big fan of hers, but I'm sure she was doing something great. Alicia Silverstone, she was like the queen of the 90s, if you were in that, like... 18 to 23 range, something because she was doing Clueless. Like, it just fascinates me how they they went all in for this whole let's let's try to get it back to that campy way of a Batman. Do you find that fascinating? Like I do. Yes, I do. And there's no doubt. Schumacher even said in an interview, I remember something along the lines of, you know, uh, I would put my casting up against anybody's, and and, mm-hmm. and he's right. He actually could get just white hot cast mm-hmm. together. And, and, you know, the people were excited. That's one of the things that's still so mystifying about Batman and Robin, that everything about it on paper looks like it's like, wow, I mean, look at this. He's got, he's even traded up maybe in terms of actors for mm-hmm. Batman, and, and uh, everything about this would look like just another, you know, success. They made that film thinking that they had knocked it out of the park. Mm-hmm. That, that they really, that, that film came together, and it's the, it's the exact, it, it literally is a traceover of, of Batman Forever, the, the fact that they, had everything that had worked the first time around and with all these actors, you know, all these, you know, new and successful actors, and it just, everything about it was like, man, we're just going to crush this one. And then, of course, <laughs> it just, just went the opposite way that it just ended up being so bad. Uh, that's one of the things I'm proud of in my book, by the way. Um, right. I actually do a a, a minute-by-minute minute comparison between Forever mm-hmm. and Batman and Robin to show that it literally is the same movie. I mean, I mean, they basically had one giant cast party to make Batman and Robin, and it was just it, it was there was no thought, there was no creativity, there was there was nothing but just excessiveness 
In fact, maybe that's it. Maybe that's why the film is just hated. It is just so excessive, just needlessly excessive and hollow. Everything about it is, is just an absolute soulless, you know, giant peacock flopping around or something. My two biggest problems with this movie is, number one, George Clooney. My problem with him is is that he tries to be the Adam West Batman. Like, the way things are set up, that's basically what he's been hired to do. But you can't do that with someone like him, because Adam West, he takes his work seriously. He, he's a professional actor, but he doesn't take himself seriously. You watch him, you know, God rest his soul, you know, when he was alive. Watch him at all these panels. Like, he really, he has a real good sense of humor. George Clooney not only takes his work seriously, but he takes himself very seriously. Like He's a serious actor. Yes, he's done comedy, but it's a lot different from, from Adam West. Like, Adam West, like, he does his Batman because he wants the audience to laugh. Like, George Clooney does his Batman. Like, if the audience laughs, fine, and if they don't, that's okay, too. So he's my number one critique. And my number two critique is Commissioner Gordon, because one of the most enjoyable guys on the 1966 TV series is Neil Hamilton, as Commissioner Gordon. Watch him do his Commissioner Gordon. It's hilarious. He takes every... My, my coffee is cold. And he... Like, it's an international crisis. Like, how he does <laughs> yeah. his, his Commissioner Gordon. And then we have Pat Hingle... Like that's not in his skill set. He's not like a, like a comedian. He's not like a he can't really do that. He's more of a western kind of guy. I remember seeing him in in fifties and sixties westerns when he when he was younger. He he, he doesn't have that skill set. So those are my main gripes with the casting of of the movie. Is is if you're gonna try to do the nineteen sixty six TV series. You have to kind of get the actors who are capable of recreating that. So that's my number one and number two gripes. Now, what what does this movie get wrong? I guess we should start with the bad because that's more what the people want to hear. What are your main gripes about this movie? Well, yeah, and I would say, I think it's kind of interesting what you're saying about Clooney. I would say detachment. That with with uh, that film, there is a detachment, and that's almost all the cast. Like, the, we don't need to try. We know this is going to be successful. We know this is going to be great. The, the 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 template is already laid out. We don't have to do anything but show up and and read our lines about like we're you know looking at the, the names in a phone book. Um, it, it's detached. It, there's there's no effort in it whatsoever, and it's just completely and utterly excessive in terms of its its ridiculousness of of, of props and sets and, and and what happens in the story it's just it's just so dumb and and, and everything about it is, is absolutely with, with with no real effort or, or any any sort of any sort of urgency of purpose yeah. put into the film at all it is just a complete and utter like they were showing up for a cast party and like oh my god we're on the gravy train let's let's party and have fun type type of a feel the, the entire way through it there's this well and boy all of a sudden I, I feel like I'm talking about peanuts so Linus Linus would say uh, you know there's no sincerity this, this this pumpkin patch here has no sincerity in it whatsoever that's what that <laughs> film feels like there is not not one ounce of sincerity it is a very very cynical enterprise and we really have a clash of what exactly are they trying to do because we have all these one-liners and we have back credit cards and we have all this nonsense but then we have alfred dying like why is that in there like yeah, it, it completely so clashes with the entire of, movie in terms of, what what name did they give it was it mcgregor's disease yeah i can't yeah, yeah. and again just a made-up name and you don't have any idea what it even is or anything like that <clears throat> it just it just couldn't be any more they couldn't have been any lazier about putting that film together. Yeah. It's just, it just means nothing. And it was like, like the whole Alfred thing, let's, you know, force in one thing. This will be our dramatic tension, you know, it, it, but it's just, it's just so needless and it, it's so pointless and it doesn't mean anything. McGregor's disease, my God. Uh, yeah, it was, it was just so bad. Um, and, and you know, it has almost no runtime. I mean, the thing is, it's super short. It feels like it goes on for 10 hours yeah. but it's actually it's it's so slight in terms of its runtime and i think it is you'll know, write just even a little bit shorter than uh the batman forever uh but but it just and, and you can beat for beat put the two films together and see they're the exact same film they cut them they cut them and, and, and from the very writing all the way through the filming and cutting it's it's just the exact same film just just they, they were they were just as lazy as could be mm -hmm. and they thought we they thought 
we buy it. I, they thought they were still given a product. Um, you know, I don't know if you ever watch a sitcom like Full House. Which oh, love is it. Awful. It, 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 I can't stop watching it. My daughter yeah. and I have always watched it. <laughs> but it, one of the things I can't stop watching about it is it's so bad so often. <laughs> it is so insincere, and it's like sometimes you feel like this is written by crazy people. What are they <laughs> What are they even talking about? But I remember uh, Bob Saget one time saying, you, you love the Full House, you ate it up like meatloaf. Yeah. And I think that that's what, um, with, with, uh, um, with, with Batman and Robin, they thought that we love it and eat it up like meatloaf. It didn't, mm-hmm. it didn't have to be all that good, but boy, it was gonna, it was gonna be a, a real crowd pleaser. Mm-hmm. And somehow it just, it just wasn't. And again, I still do think that, that, that the, the power of the Batman character, the power of it being a, of him being a serious character is what sank that film. The people were like, no, the Batman that, that we now know, this, this is not acceptable for the, for the Batman we've grown to love. The movie is basically just the most expensive and longest toy commercial in history. <laughs> that's basically yeah, no what doubt it is. about it. Oh man, yeah, the, and that's again, again, another very cynical thing that we will we will sell toys. And again, to bring it back to kind of the Full House analogy, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, we got to get Mary Kate and Ashley in there, and mm-hmm. you know, people uh, just adore them. You know, they become just this this commodity, mm-hmm. and certainly with the Batman stuff, that, that it's, it's like you know the commodity of all the products. It's like you're going to see the Batmobile, you're going to see Mr. Freeze's Ice Mobile, and you're going to want to buy these, buy, buy, buy. Um, yeah, there's no, no doubt about it that that, they, that it was very much something that was designed to be a commercial enterprise. Yeah, as we talk about it being cynical, it's silly. We didn't even mention that part of it. That's always been an issue for the Batman characters that they're always trying to you know sell merchandise and sell toys. No doubt about it. In Batman Forever, okay, they snuck it in on us because the Batcave was destroyed. He needs a new suit. Okay, I can buy that. He The Batboat, the Batplane, okay, or Batwing, okay, that's fine because he doesn't have a Batmobile anymore and he has to get where the Riddler is and he doesn't have a Batsuit anymore because they were all destroyed. So, okay, I can buy that. But in Batman and Robin, why is he changing suits to go after Mr. Freeze? This this is just them clearly telling us, hey, we only made this move so we can sell toys because there is no reason for that. He, Mr. Freeze is freezing the city, but you know what? I'm going to go change into this other Batsuit and let everyone freeze to death. Like, <laughs> oh, but this cool metallic Batsuit yeah. looks so good against yeah. all, the, all the icy uh, yeah. uh, residue on the street and stuff so yeah this will be great these are our ice suits yeah they, they, oh my god the whole scene at the end where, where you do have Batman Robin and Batgirl yeah. wearing those costumes and, and they are I, I think I said in the book something like you know they're so divorced from visually from what the characters look like their time honored visual tradition it's like you may as well be looking at stormtroopers in a Star Wars film they're not even it's not even Batman Robin and Batgirl I don't yeah. know what it is yeah that is just oh my god yeah like you say though in terms of the, the selling and I will say that I'm not going to knock the merchandising in the sense that as a longtime Batman fan, one of the fun things about it for me personally is collecting the Batman stuff. Right. You know, now that Justice League is coming out, I was instantly, you know, the, the week that all the merchandise was being released, I couldn't wait to get out and hit the stores and, and see what new stuff they would have and what I would want for my Batman collection and stuff. I I think that the merchandising is a big part of the Batman mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. So, so I won't knock. It. I'm not saying I don't want any merchandise, but but it did become it, that that was all that was happening within within something like Batman and Robin. They were doing nothing but but selling toys. What does Batman and Robin do right? There is nothing. <laughs> I'm like you. You can't even come up with one thing. I think in the book I'd said maybe the one scene where you had Clooney and, and Gal uh, talking, you know, sort of discussing what the, Alfred's life had been like, sort of being in, in, in the service of heroes and, right. and, and that. I, I can almost live with that scene. I, uh, uh, and to me, Clooney's affable, but it is just detached. And, 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 and that's maybe one scene I could actually watch without, without you know, my head spinning but but everything else is it's just just awful there's just I, I hate the way chris o'donnell is in terms of the way the character looks and sounds and acts and the way he's written it's just everything about it's wrong i just i can't it, it's just just unbearable and i remember that seeing that in the theaters the first time again going in kind of being like i think something's off here but i'm not quite sure and again i saw one of the advanced screenings or whatever and once i saw it just just 
I just couldn't couldn't believe what I was seeing. I just it was like, oh my god, it's the death of the franchise. It barely even got to start, and and it's over. I, I can't believe we're we're there. <laughs> so the next Batman movie we get doesn't happen until 2005. Now, before we get into the Nolan trilogy, I wanted to ask you some some quick questions here. Now, obviously, the Batman character is so flexible. Frank Miller has this saying that he always says, he's like a great big diamond. You smack it with a hammer, throw it against the wall, Batman doesn't break. He can work in several different ways. But there's a lot of Batman stories, like Nightfall, where the concept is good, but how we actually put it all together is not that tight like there's there's a lot of things that we can do without but you know the concept of okay well batman's gonna have his back broken he has to pass the cowl to someone else in his absence the guy he chooses is the wrong guy for it and then batman has to come back and and take it back from him that's a good concept but it doesn't it doesn't work out as as good as the concept is and there's there's other ones like the death of Robin, like the the story really isn't that good, and really no one even remembers the story. They only remember really that Robin died. So there's there's a lot of stories like that. So what do you think is the best Batman concept, regardless of how it all plays out? I think it always comes back to the center. Uh, so many of the things, like the ones you just mentioned, in so many of these stories, it is always to put in a major. Uh, the, the, the plan is to put in a major earth-shaking event. I will never be the same again. Um, but it's always going to go back to the same thing. Uh, eventually, it will play back to Bruce Wayne as Batman, and it, of course now Dick Grayson being Nightwing. But Dick Grayson will be a hit, hit one of his major proteges. He'll be in Wayne Manor, and he'll fight this incredible, you know, uh, cast of, of villains, you know, in in Gotham City. That, that is what Batman is going to be, and then. That's what Batman has always been, and that's where he will always get back to, no matter how you play it out. And, and I mean, you can just go on and on and on. And right now, DC is just reinventing. Now it's just with numbing regularity every couple of years. You know, at first off, when they were going to, you know, uh, completely start all the comics over. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. What was the last? Uh, um, were rebirth now. Yeah, DC what was the rebirth. Thing before that, they did. There was the um, new Fifty Two. The new Fifty Two, of course, yeah. right? Exactly. The new Fifty Two. When you were taking, you know, you just have Fifty Two separate comics, and literally everything would start over. Yeah. And that was supposed to mean something to me that that you know, Batman number one, that they would be suspended. We would start with you know, and have a new number one. It's all just it's 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 just merchandising publicity gimmicks to try and get people in. And I guess I can understand why because I'm not in. in in terms of the buying the, the regular comics the way I used to be, uh, but but so much of it for me is uh, Batman plays when he is to that to that center point. You know, as I just mentioned to you, what what a great Batman story is to me is is the Batman that has always been the Batman since you know Detective Comics twenty seven on. You know, uh, the, the cast of characters and and the way he operates and stuff like that. That's the Batman I want to see. I don't want to see that stuff changed. I just want to see good stories written that that. That you know, take the character there. Um, but just over and over, we're going to just continue. You know, new Robins, old Robins, people dying. You know, uh, it, just the flashpoint. You know, uh, just uh, everything. Everything they're going to keep trying to change it. But what's going to happen is it's still going to drift back to the way that we've we've all always known and loved it. I think it's like Sherlock Holmes. You know, Sherlock Holmes needs to be at, at Baker Street with Watson solving crimes, and that's that's how it is with Batman as well. Too, he needs to be a Wayne Manor working out of the Batcave, and it needs to be Bruce Wayne, you know, and that's, that's always what it's going to turn out to be. Whether it's from a movie, a TV show, a cartoon, a comic, regardless of where the story was told, what's your favorite Batman story of all time? Well, I mentioned Batman War on Crime, and that would probably be my favorite. The, 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 the oversized graphic novel uh, by, by uh, Paul Dini <laughs> and, and uh, Alex Ross, in terms of what it does, it to me is just a miracle. Um, it, it is, it's basically set within, it could basically be an episode of the animated series when it comes right down to it, but the fact that everything is in there, that we get, we get every aspect of the Batman mythos and this sort of amazing, powerful story about what is it I'm doing? Is, is this worth it? Should I keep doing this? Um, and and it, it, the, the relentless quest for justice, um, you know, is, 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 portrayed so powerfully and, and the fact that the Batman will just never stop. It's as simple as that. He 
is he is as long as there's a breath in him, he is going to be doing this because it's the, the right thing to do. Um, that that out of everything, that's that's the that's the one that for me is probably the well I go back to over and over again. Favorite piece of Batman merchandise you own? I guess it's probably my life size Batman with the costume I put together standing in, in, in the basement. There can't be anything better than Batman actually right there. It is Batman. <laughs> All my family's had to get used to him. There's a bunch of stuff down there. I've got a number of uh, large size posters and life size cutouts and stuff like that. But having having Batman actually standing there, it, it can't it can't be any better than than, than Batman actually being in your house. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and it is a Batman that looks very much exactly like the the Batman uh, uh, painted by Alex Ross for for War, War on Crime. So it's not only not only my favorite book, but literally Batman is in my house uh, looking just like that, uh, standing vigil at all times. So that would probably be my favorite. Is that your favorite bat suit? That'd be my favorite. Yes. That, that would be my favorite. Boy, there's so many that I love. In terms of once you get the, the Neil Adams, you know, darker blue with the yellow oval around around the uh, around the, the bat symbol and stuff, that, that would be my others. But there's, like you mentioned, even like with Batman Forever, uh, what's that one suit that they call it? I can't remember. Maybe it's just a prototype. It's like a sonar or something. I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's yeah. a sonar. I can't remember. Um, and isn't it, don't they call the one that's in the beginning of the film the Panzer suit for some reason? I think that's what I've seen that uh, for used before as well too um, oh but you know Adam West costume in terms of one of the things that, that would be a great fantasy of mine is I would like to take the Weston Ward costumes and actually film a, 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 a Batman mm. uh, a story of something that is actually done I'm, I, one of my all time favorite stories is one called Hunt for a Robin Killer which is back from the late 60s mm. uh, which is sort of a serious uh, comic story in which uh, a guy uh, almost beats Robin to death because he has a grudge directly against him. Um, to me, to actually take the characters from the 60s show um, and do, do a, a, a show like that, something that was a, a more a realistic, noirish uh, crime drama, boy, would I love to see that. Yeah, I still, I still love the Adam West suit. There's photos, certain ones, I'm like, man, that's still just, that is Batman as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, I, I love it all. There are very few that I could come up with that I, that I don't like. I, I wasn't a fan of the Dark Knight Returns big armor at the end. To me, that kind of took away from just the look of the character, and obviously that became a big part of the Batman versus Superman mm-hmm. movie. So uh, I, I never did like that because I felt like the identity was kind of squashed. Obviously, what we talked about with, with Batman and, and Robin, but but I love so many different directions the, the costume has gone over the years. Favorite Batmobile? You know what? I, I'm, <laughs> I don't, out of all the ones that we've seen, I think the concept of, of the Tumblr of, of Nolan's is still something that is that is so utilitarian that, that that still was so startling after all of the kind of fancy sports cars we've seen. Favorite leading lady from a Batman movie? Um, I think I'd probably still pick uh, Lee Merriweather as Catwoman. I think I think having having uh, the the Catwoman character, uh, what uh, what that got to do for the story and, and what it got to do for for uh, portraying Batman was was very very cool. The idea at the end that once he realizes it's somebody that he cares about and he's instantly like a snap cuffs cuffs on this doesn't matter. That that to me is kind of badass attitude that all these Batmen should have. So many of the films we've seen where they're instantly ready to give up their cape and cow because oh it's too much and and uh, the Adam West. Batman, who we think is the most cheery, um, is the one who instantly says, hey, you're not stopping me no matter what. Yeah, you thought I cared about her? No, send her to jail. (laughs) Throughout his almost 80-year existence, he's been called many things. He's been called the Cape Crusader, the Dark Knight, the Dark Knight Detective, the world's greatest detective, the Bat, the Masked Manhunter. He's got so many different nicknames, but what's your favorite nickname for him? Probably the Dark Knight, because it does it date back to Batman number one. The fact that it was in that very first issue is, is still such an amazing thing. And that, that, that phrase has such a, a great uh, history. 
history, you know, to be that far back. But then really the only person who picked it up after that was uh, Steve Englehart. He used it in, in that uh, series I was talking about, the detective comics in the uh, in the late 70s. And, and he he's the one who revived it. He actually used it there, and then Miller went and took it. But, but it would not be fair to say that Miller's actually the one who single-handedly brought it back. It was actually Steve Englehart who it, it's, it's in print before, before Miller picked it up again. There's been several Batman movies that scripts were written or ideas people had come up with and the studio had greenlit or or wanted to move forward with, but for whatever reason they fell apart in the end. Movies like Batman Unchained, Batman Dark Knight, Joel Schumacher's year one that he wanted to make, Frank Miller and Darren Aronofsky's year one, and then there was Batman vs. Superman. Not Batman v. Superman, Batman vs. Superman. Of those movies, Batman movies that were on the table or in the works or people had thought about making them, of those movies, which one were you most interested in? Are you most interested in seeing or wish they would have made? Uh, I'd go back actually further. The original thought that once uh, the 78 Superman had come out... Is is uh, you know Batman entered into development hell? Um, actually, Englehart had written a script at that time, and they were trying to figure that out. Um, something that would have been not quite as late as the late '80s. Something you know that, that would have been uh, late '70s, early '80s. Um, but that that uh, that Englehart script is probably. I would love to have seen what they could have done if if they could have done something on the heels of, of the the Reeves Superman. I think we would have gotten something that was maybe even more comic book oriented, a little bit more um, Adams O'Neill, uh, uh, Englehart Rogers. I, that out of everything, if I could have seen anything, that's what I would have wanted to see. Whether he's deceased or alive now but not in his prime or he's an actor in his prime is there an actor that you can think of off the top of your head that would make a good batman that's never got a chance to put on the cowl oh i think a lot of people felt that that clint eastwood at the time of the dirty harry films Mm -hmm. and stuff would have been would have been a perfect guy Mm -hmm. I, i think when you look back at that time clint eastwood would have been a spectacular batman now let's move to the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy. Now, I'm trying to go back in time and think in my head, but weren't they kind of marketing this movie at the beginning not as a trilogy, and this was just supposed to be a Batman movie, and they weren't going to build off this? Does that sound familiar at all? Because I have a booklet where it, it lumps this Christopher Nolan Batman Begins movie in with the first four that were with Tim Burton and Joel Schumacher. So does that sound familiar at all? Yes, in fact, there was, um, I forget which uh, um, critic it was, the, the famous critic uh, at, at Time Magazine was writing, calling this a prequel. Right. Um, and, you know, it's nothing like a prequel in terms mm-hmm. of having anything to do with, with the Burton Schumacher films. It is a, totally a reboot. Um, but, but there were people trying to lump it with, with that original canon. And then to me at the time, yes, it wasn't going to be something that was a multi-film deal. To me, it was, it was a very modest restart. It's like, well, okay, we've had everything go wrong here. What what can we do? You know, now now that we've had Batman and Robin, you know, how can we how can we do a new film with this character and not use any of those existing? Uh, you know, they had to walk quite the tightrope because they couldn't use any of the villains. You know, we had burned through the Joker, the the Penguin, the the Riddler, the Catwoman, uh, Mister Freeze, Poison Ivy, even Bane. And, you know, they were they were like, well, you know, what's left? What characters? do we have and how you know, how can we use any of these characters in terms of it can't be you know, starting up from Batman and Robin. So uh, obviously what they ended up coming up with was an origin story that, that, that uh, featured uh, uh, um, Roz and, and the Scarecrow. Mm-hmm. And those characters were being kicked around. You'll remember that, that Schumacher was supposedly going to get a third film. Batman Triumphant would have been mm-hmm. the Scarecrow and Roz uh, most likely. Um, so it was basically the, the idea of, of what the next continuation would have been, but let you know, let's take it totally back and let's start the character completely over. So you basically get a mix of uh, of what would have happened with another Schumacher film and the idea of doing Year One. If you can go back to your mindset in 2005, what were you thinking before seeing Batman Begins? Because Batman Begins was not 
a hyped film. This was not. I, I don't remember seeing much publicity. I mean, the, the the Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, like the merchandise was flooding the market. Every it was on every magazine, every first look show, all that kind of stuff. Batman and Batman Begins kind of just snuck up on everyone. It really wasn't that like this is the the must see movie of the summer. Like everyone get on board with this. You know how they like to do it nowadays in Hollywood is call everything a blockbuster even before people have even seen it. And usually that that means that the the movie is not very good because you know we've seen a lot of movies. Oh, this is the next summer blockbuster and it's a complete bomb. But this movie wasn't like that. It it didn't have a lot of hype surrounding it. So what do you remember about the build up to the movie? Well, that's funny. For me personally, it actually was still going to be the the movie of the century. I was so excited about it. For me personally, it, it was something that we had been following the making of it, and uh, that kind of brings up uh, the website Batman on Film. That was something that uh, Bill Ramey had started after you know after Batman and Robin, saying we need to see a good Batman movie, and that that you know the internet becomes a, a major factor in terms of the connection between fans and. Stuff. And so all of us who were huge Batman fans um, knew that, that Forever was, I mean, excuse me, that that, uh, that Returns, not Returns, Forever Returns, Batman Begins. Right. <laughs> all of us knew that Batman Begins was coming. And, and because of that, we were, we were all just really, really stoked. And there were still enough toys out there. In fact, my, my basement is filled with a lot of giant things from Toys R Us. I think they're not supposed to ever give those away, but somehow I ended up getting a hold of a bunch of the, the, the giant and, you know, display things that they had in there uh, once the film was coming out and stuff. So, so there was there was enough there. It was more modest. You're right, though. The idea of how everything has become a, yo know, the must-see event of the summer and that sort of thing. And in this case, um, it was something that was modest, and I think that actually, I think that worked in the film's favor. I think the idea that it was something that, that was a little bit, you know, more whispered about um, and, and, you know, like, get ready, you know, and people just sort of got walloped with it once it came out. But for those those of us who were fans, we had, I mean, I was just, just you know, practically dying. I, I forget if it was on uh, Smallville or something, somewhere they had done like a 10-minute preview of the film where they were going to show it on on, on some, some network. I remember, you know, getting ready to see that, and I actually, I think one of the scenes is they panned across a skyscraper and you see Batman standing on the skyscraper in silhouette, you know, like tears in my eyes. It's like, oh my God, we're back after everything that's happened and no films. We really are going to see this in a way that, that is, is every bit as good as the 89 film, or maybe even better. Um, yeah, for me, for me personally, that was, that was a big, big deal as, as, as that came down the road. I view Batman Begins as basically a longer, more complete version of Year One. There's so many elements that are taken from Year One and put into this movie. And I like Year One, but... I love Batman Begins even more because it's just like year one except we have more background, we have more time, we have more depth to everybody. So that's really, if you love year one, Batman Begins, in my opinion, they go hand in hand. Do you agree? Yes, definitely. The the, the whole the whole uh, making of the film takes so much from year one. Uh, there's there's no doubt that, 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 that just just tons and tons of content is, is pulled from that, and that's exactly the way they should have done it. And, and that that I just loved. And I, I'm like you that, that it was it, it was the tonic that, that we needed after what had happened with the Schumacher films uh, to to be able to get that. And just the first scene, I'll never forget seeing the the movie you know for the first time and. and and when you see the first scene of, of, of Bale, and, and, and he's and he's uh, in, in that prison, as he walks out, and he's just all dirty and disheveled and unshaven and standing there, and already I looked at him and was like, he is Batman. Mm-hmm. He doesn't even have to have the costume on. At this moment, this guy, unlike any actor who's ever played the role, this guy is Batman. I can, I already believe it. It, 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 just, it, it excites me to even talk about it now. That, mm-hmm. that to me was such a cool thing to see, that he really was. He really was that part, just right out of the gate, just, just the, the such such the right actor for the first time. You know, we didn't have these slight kind of leading men, sometimes detached. You had a guy who was just an absolute, just 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 a badass standing there. <laughs> it was it was awesome. That that to me that that first moment, I'll never forget that seeing him. He 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 had me he had me just before he said a word. Batman Begins. What does that movie do right? Oh, the strengths are just endless in that film. <clears throat> Probably 
first and foremost, um, when you look at, at all of the, the great Batman stories in, in, in screen works that it drew on, it takes, you know, from everything. It, it you know, stuff from, from Batman number one, from, from, uh, from stuff in the animated series, uh, it, it takes a lot from that story called The Man Who Falls, so many origin things, um, and, and it, it just, it just never stops in terms of, of the great material that it chooses to draw on, and, and it, it, it is, it does choose very good material. It, it is unerring in terms of getting the right stuff. Um, so from from that standpoint, and then just the casting, you know, just across the board in terms of all of the the, the, the major parts are just filled with just wonderful actors that just you know deliver it so so wonderfully. Um, one thing that, that had struck me as strange, and this is that you and I were talking about the idea of when the first you know, pictures came out and the film was kind of sneaking up on people, those of us who were fans and who were looking at it were thinking about it. I remember at the time thinking about um, seeing the first costume pictures, and I remember actually being slightly disappointed because the costume was so similar to uh, the, the Schumacher mm -hmm. costumes, a little right. bit more armored and, and uh, you know, kind of, kind of rubbery and balloony and stuff. And at the time, I remember thinking I didn't care for that quite as much. I was hoping for a little bit more departure with a more comic book costume, uh, but but that still didn't bother me that, that much. I felt like it still worked within it. I felt that Bale in costume was a wonderfully convincing uh, uh, Batman. So, uh, yeah, th those are just, you know, so, some of the strengths, but, but it just it just had it, it had the, the depth and it had the thoughtfulness and having Bale right at the center of it was just, just fabulous. I mean, he was just so good. It was just, uh, so, much, so much fun to watch him in the role. I really do love this movie, and my one teeny tiny critique, it isn't really even a critique since it's so tiny, is the only part of the movie that I really don't like is the part where Alfred has to talk Bruce Wayne into being the playboy. Like, I always feel like Batman should always, that should be as much of his disguise as his mask. Like, all right, I, I can't leave any stone unturned. I have to cover myself and I have to be th this, this mask that I'm wearing in front of the public. I have to be this wild playboy to, to cover up that, oh, this guy, he has no time to be Batman. He, he's off doing all this stuff. He's dating all these models. He's going on all these exotic vacations this and this and that. He doesn't have time for any of this stuff. So that's my one teeny tiny critique of the movie is that Alfred has to talk him into that. Besides that, it's really a, a, a tight movie. So what does this movie get wrong in your opinion? Well, and it's funny. Well, what you just said, that's actually a really good springboard for my one uh, mm -hmm. minor complaint. I would also say mine's minor and it's almost the exact same as yours. Um, the, the thing that I found strange and it, I'm, I'm disappointed to say somebody else pointed it out to me. I walked away from it not seeing it. And I'd seen it a few times before somebody mentioned it to me. I was like, oh, my gosh, this really is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that that, um, that Bruce is not versed within science and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and technology and, and, and physics and chemicals and stuff like that, mm -hmm. when when uh, when Morgan Freeman is, is, is talking to him, when you've got Lucius talking to him mm -hmm. about, oh, I had to synthesize this compound, and, uh, and, and Bruce actually says, well, am I meant to understand any of this? I don't know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. And, and, uh, and and that, that really bothered me the more I thought about it because it's like uh, Bruce should know that. It's actually exactly like your idea of, of, uh, of Bruce uh, having his, his uh, playboy disguise. Mm -hmm. Certain things he should be completely in control of. He should mm -hmm. be wise beyond his years and smart beyond his years. Like, I know this and I'm, I'm the one who can, who can take care of this stuff. That, that to me, both of those things kind of go hand in hand that they actually made him... Uh, even though he's young, he shouldn't be that green. He would actually be, he would be smart enough and then he would be determined enough that these things he would have already taken care of. Batman Begins, like we've been saying a little bit earlier that it kind of snuck up on people. The next movie, The Dark Knight, sneaks up on no one. Everyone is anticipating this movie. People who had never seen the previous Batman movies, people who had never read a comic book in their life, they're all on board because of this movie. And... The main reason they're on board is because they want to see what Heath Ledger is going to do as the Joker. Now, I was one of those people who couldn't really see Heath Ledger as the Joker. And the reason I couldn't see it is because he didn't do the prototypical Joker performance in this movie. He, 
He doesn't do the Joker. He does a version of the Joker, but he doesn't do the version of the Joker that I most identify with. Like, Mark Hamill and what he does on the animated series is more of my Joker. The Joker that Heath Ledger does, although it's entertaining and it's well done, he doesn't really do the Joker that that I thought he was going to do. So... A lot of people were against Heath Ledger before this movie was shown in theaters. So go back to that time. Were you one of those people who couldn't see Heath Ledger as the Joker? Yeah, in fact, that, that brings up a few interesting things. Uh, first off, one one thing to back up with Begins, because this kind of uh, dovetails into sure. going to the Dark Knight, um, you have the film ending with that wonderful scene with mm-hmm. the rooftop conference between Gordon. Oh, man, we didn't even talk about Gary Oldman. Uh, Gary Oldman as Commissioner Gordon. He right. was just, just genius. He was so good. Um, but, but that scene is among my, my favorite scenes in any Batman film when you have Commissioner Gordon and Batman talking on the roof with the bat mm-hmm. signal for the first time and you know talking about how the joker you know they've had this this first this first appearance of this this uh, criminal um that to me is, is such a tremendous tremendous moment and such a, a great springboard um so uh, for, from there you know you, you've got the idea of the joker the stage being set so the stage is set for the dark night my feeling about ledger and this is before he had died mm-hmm. um the first photo that was released, it was kind of like what Nolan did with, uh, with Batman Begins in terms of releasing the, uh, um, the, the, the picture of the Tumblr. Right. He had released a photo that was sort of an up-close picture of, of, of Ledger in makeup, and it struck me as being sort of rubber-faced and odd and, and not the Joker. Like you said, it's not, not the Joker that, that in the time-honored tradition of the comics that, mm-hmm. that, I, am, that, that I was used to. So I was a little off-put by that as I was seeing it. Um, but by the same token, you know, after the success of Begins, I was more than willing to run with Nolan in terms of whatever he wanted to, to do with it. As I saw the film, and once I started to see the way the Joker was, was portrayed, it's still not my thing. Right. Uh, the idea of him being dirty and disheveled mm-hmm. and sort of corrosive, that's not the Joker in terms of, I think of the Joker um, as being so evil, uh, just resplendent and evil, and that he would probably smell like a, you know, a, 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 a princess, you know, mm-hmm. on, right. a, on a, a, a you know, at a, a banquet or something like that, that his manners would be completely refined and he would be exactly fastidious and, and perfect. He would be so filled with himself. The idea of the Joker actually being this grimy, sort of smelly uh, street urchin just didn't didn't make quite so much sense to me. Um, but as I say that, even though I was going into the film with that perspective, being like, well, that's not really the Joker in terms of the way I see the character. As I always say, these characters can be, can be bent and shaped and molded any way that somebody wants to, so I was more than happy to, to explore uh, Nolan's uh, take on the character, a very different one. Um, so yes, that, that, that was something I thought about, and then obviously everything got right out of control as, as Ledger had died, and like say the, the the anticipation for the movie was already unbearably high, and then having this, this tragic death all of a sudden, I mean, it just went even more. It was just, just a worldwide crazy phenomenon by that point. What does The Dark Knight do right? I love a lot about The Dark Knight, and I hate a lot about The Dark Knight. And I may be more alone in that in terms of I, I'm probably a little bit more of a Nolan detractor than a lot of people. As I say, with it Begins, you. man, it came through. And that, to me, was almost a, a standalone. Uh, there's a few other things we'll probably talk about later on that relate back to it. But mm-hmm. somehow, as Nolan had done that, he did that film in a sense that if that was the only Batman film he ever did. He actually mm-hmm. sort of tied up a lot of different mm-hmm. loose ends and sort of made it look like you know that this is where Batman would go from here. Well, we'll I'm sure we'll mention a few of those later. Um, but once all of a sudden the success of that film and he was given the chance to do it again, all of a sudden it was like, well, you know, I'm actually going to tell tell a much longer story arc here. You know, what am I going to do with that? Um, and as he went for that and to, to pick up the Joker um, and to have Batman versus Joker, the classic confrontation, you know, he, and, and him being able to take that on. There's a lot he does right. There's certain things about it I think are a little too ambitious. But in terms of what's right about it, again, uh, all of the principal actors are fabulous. The the first setup, the the, the realism of the film, again, is is just right in, in the right place. Uh, everything everything about that is is amazing. And having filmed it in IMAX, that's 
something else that we hadn't discussed with Begins. Begins got released to where you could go and see it in IMAX theaters, mm-hmm. um, and you know, like science centers and stuff like that were showing it on you know five story high movie screens and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, and, and Nolan was obviously so impressed with that. He's like, I'm gonna actually film a lot of The Dark Knight uh, in in IMAX, and it's actually shot in that incredible high definition. That to me was was an absolute uh, revelation. That that was a game changer in terms of in terms of cinema. I don't I don't know if you got to see it within IMAX theaters, but but I saw it repeatedly in IMAX. I, and again, talking about always my scorecard, how many times I see these mm-hmm. films, I'm sure I saw uh, Dark Knight at least fifteen or more times in, in the movie theater, and always seeing it in, in IMAX, getting to take it in that way. The, the spectacle of that film is is just draw jaw dropping. You just it, it is just an amazing amazing film in terms of of what it does visually. And again, so many of the moments, these incredible Batman moments, uh, I, I I love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, we didn't. And in terms of casting too, we didn't talk about uh, Killian Murphy getting the Scarecrow from from the you know begins to have that character right. carry over and to have it start to be a little bit more episodic, where you mm-hmm. have more than one villain and stuff was very cool. What does the film get wrong? That's where maybe I part ways with a number of people. Story construction, story construction, mm-hmm. story construction. That film falls totally apart mm-hmm. until by the end it makes no sense whatsoever. It, it just it, it is so ambitious in terms of what he wanted to do story-wise that eventually gets so hyperactive in terms of everything that is going on, everything that is being said and done, it doesn't, it, it can't make any sense. There's, there are just moments in the film that literally are total head scratchers. They don't make any sense. And there's, there's nobody in the world that is ever going to convince me that the ferry boat scene makes any sense. Those huge boats which hold thousands, yeah. and supposedly they pass around these pieces of paper to have these boats and they end up with like 400 votes. It doesn't make any sense. And, and, and that whole story makes no sense. The people who would say, oh, those people on that other boat, they deserve to die. We're going to mm-hmm. blow them up. Well, what about all of the security guards right. and, 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 right. the, and the people who are op, uh, operating the boat? If these are good people, they wouldn't be sending those people to their doom. Right. It doesn't make any sense. Right. So, so that, the, the film eventually um, wore on me to the point that I was like, this is just this this is not good writing mm-hmm. and and what happens with the joker his all powerful ability to to commit evil makes no sense how in the world is he blowing up an entire hospital nobody notices any bombs mm-hmm. how in the world are those those huge fairies rigged with all those bombs right. that nobody has seen it doesn't how is he bringing down that helicopter and getting a fire engine you know in the middle of the street who's working for him how in the world is this stuff being organized it doesn't make any sense. And then, to top all that off the story construction, you have Batman quitting being Batman right. because the Joker has threatened him. And that right. is the absolute antithesis of the character. That is a slap in the face to what Batman is about. Batman never stops. If, if the Joker is out there and he is committing evil, he is committing crime, Batman will not rest, sleep, eat. He will not stop until until he stops him. That whole you know, press conference thing, that, oh, I'll turn myself into the Joker. Mm-hmm. My God, that's right. not Batman. That is right. just not the character. So, so that to me is where Nolan all of a sudden got all hyperactive mm-hmm. and and silly and and, and and illogical that the film just began to make no sense whatsoever. I love it. I mean, it was a huge watershed moment in the mm-hmm. history of the character. There's certain things about it I love, but in general, when it comes down to it, it, it ends up being just about as invalid as Batman and Robin to me personally, or Batman uh, Returns. So mm-hmm. the, it doesn't make sense. What is happening with Batman and the character, that is not what what the time-honored you know tradition of Batman is. Batman Begins, love it, all of it's great. Certain moments, like what you're saying in Dark Knight, are the tipping point, and then when we get into Dark Knight Rises, everything, uh, I'll, I'll save it for that, but every like there's certain moments in here that it clashes with what Nolan's going for. He, this is supposed to be Batman as if he was an actual person, and some of the stuff that, that's happening in this are unbelievable. Like it, it, like it just all completely doesn't make any sense. And, and what, a, really, a waste of Two Face in oh, this movie. Yeah. The character is completely yeah. wasted. And not only is the character wasted, but all they do is obsess over him. The yeah. Harvey Dent was somehow, you know, the, the city is in flames. The Joker's mm-hmm. killed everybody, and, and you know everything is completely chaos. But it's like, 
oh well, people would really lose hope if if uh, Harvey Dent was was yeah. you know had gone bad or something like that. It's like everything else that's happened isn't going to isn't going to impact that more. It it it, it is a, a, a natural fixation on a character that is not shown anywhere near enough, and then Harvey Dent, right. you know, Two Face is over without anyone even ever having seen Two Face or or you know been exposed to the character. Yeah, it makes makes no sense to me. It's a complete wasted opportunity in terms of Two Face. And he was only in Nolan's universe for like five minutes. He w- he wasn't even in Batman Begins. He's not that guy who, in the beginning of Batman Begins, is talking to Rachel Dawes. Like Harvey Dent just shows up in Dark Knight, and he turns into Two Face, and then he dies. Like there really isn't enough to work with. Like I don't really believe in him. Like you know that whole slogan, "Believe in Harvey Dent," all that stuff. I don't really believe in him because I don't see enough of him. Like it feels like if they were going to go down this direction, he had to be in the first movie. Yes, I completely agree. And that was the amazing thing about the animated series: the way that they, right. Right. the way that they portrayed Harvey Dent was was incredible in the sense that he was introduced as Bruce's friend Mm -hmm. and somebody who actually had some own you know personal demons that were going to lead toward toward the problems he would eventually have, you know, becoming a criminal Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So much more fleshed out. Mm -hmm. It just it just didn't make any sense within the concept of uh in the concept of of the Dark Knight. They try to tap into his psychological side when when he goes after that guard who was the joker broke out of arkham and he's a certified schizophrenic like they try to show all right this guy does have a kind of dark side but it they don't do it well enough to make me buy it and also to what you were saying there's two things one in in batman the animated series they use like like harvey dent is a symbol of hope like he is the guy who can right the wrongs but also he's a friend of bruce wayne so batman also has that personal connection like I failed my friend. He was close with me, and now this bad stuff has happened, so i got to go stop this guy who's also my friend. And that adds a little bit more drama to the story where we're losing it because he's kind of basically Harvey Dent's rival for Rachel's heart in that movie. And and really, that's his only connection to him besides they're they're both trying to clean the city up. So I can see where, where that is, but it just... We, we get into Dark Knight Rises, and... Heath Ledger's death, I still believe, hurts that movie because I don't believe that the Nolan movie in 2012, Dark Knight Rises, that's the movie he wanted to make. I think he just had to look at what was available to him and try to put the pieces together and make a puzzle that he could put on screen. Is that how you feel also? That's exactly how I feel. It makes no sense. And and the weird thing about it is it's like, okay, so if your game has changed since Ledger's not here, to have the Joker be the central force behind uh, the, the crime in Gotham and stuff like that, to not have him even mentioned in The Dark Knight Rises mm-hmm. makes no sense whatsoever. I, they literally don't account for him. And, I, and to me, it makes his presence even bigger. It's the fact that, that Nolan had a plan, Ledger died, and Nolan was so freaked out that he actually just, just went and just, just did a film it's like okay we'll just completely mm-hmm. pretend that he never existed and to me uh, again this this is something that's selfishly as an audience member this is not a personal thing I understand that he was very uh, you know upset personally by losing mm-hmm. Ledger that, that that was a very sad thing for him but uh, but it, it, it he has to he has to find a way to account for that if he's going to make that film you have right. to it doesn't make any sense to have that movie and to have everything going on and have every last person who's been a major player within his trilogy and did not have one mention of the Joker. It, it, yeah, just, it just, to me, was just so far off the mark. There's so much that's wrong with The Dark Knight Rises, but that's certainly one of the absolute biggest things that's wrong with it. What's wrong with The Dark Knight carries over right into The Dark Knight Rises because why does Batman go away for ten years? There, it, yeah. He was I, Batman for like a day, we saw his year one in Batman Begins, and we've seen what I guess is his next adventure because, like you said, at the end of Batman Begins, we see the Joker card, so it happens in, in, in pretty quick time. Like, it's the next week from when the events of Batman Begins ended, and he's been Batman for 10 seconds, and then he just gives up. I, I didn't understand that, and I don't understand the Robin John Blake character. He, he makes no sense to me, and uh, because of Heath Ledger's death... Christopher Nolan has to make a movie where 
he can, okay, let's tie it all back together. Let's bring the first movie to the third movie, and we'll just have the middle, which was Dark Knight, we'll just have that like a, like a, a bonus Batman adventure, but really the first and the third movies are the ones that you need to be watching, because there's no, what was Talia al Ghul doing for all these years? She knows that Batman killed her dad. Why is she waiting tw- almost 12 years at this point to kill him? Like, it makes no sense. There's so many flaws to this movie. What, what does this movie get wrong? Oh, boy. boy. <laughs> it's, it's so good you actually uh, gave, gave me a, a, a great en- entrance into the other thing I wanted to mention. The idea that, that begins with a completely separate film from The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises. One of the scenes in Begins, remember when, uh, when Batman gives that, that piece of equipment to that kid who walks out um, of, of, the, uh, of the Narrows. He's yes. listening to his parents fight. Mm-hmm. He, he walks right. out and he sees Batman. And he's like, you know, nobody will believe that I saw you. Mm-hmm. And Batman gives him, gives him that, that, that like sonar equipment and stuff right. like that that goes on. And you've got this little kid. That little kid is wearing a bright red shirt and he knows Batman's identity. Right. And then at the end of the film, he actually hears uh, Rachel call him Bruce. Right. The kid's Robin. There's no doubt the kid's Robin. Right. Hey, everything about that, when you saw it, um, was was leading you to believe that, that that was going to be a character that actually knew uh, Batman's identity, was was involved you know, in, in, in knowing Batman and even a way to maybe trace back to Batman. Um, oh, and you know, that kid, it's, it's uh, what's his name, Jack Gleason? He's in Game of Thrones, I guess. Is okay. that right? I think that's. I think that's. I think that's who. I think that's who it is. Anyway, he's yeah. only billed as the little boy in the story. Right. You don't get anything but little boy is, is the right. way he's billed. But everything about it, as you see, it's like, well, that kid is so obviously Robin. That's, right. that's where they're going. But then, obviously, um, whatever Nolan decided once you got to the Dark Knight and the Dark Knight Rises, he just rewrote the rules. Right. And all of a sudden, you you have the John Blake character, which is just mm-hmm. just terrible. I mean, just just so bad in terms of the construction of that character and what they did. And obviously, John Blake is Tim Drake. You know, right. is the they just sort of changed the name. Yeah. If they'd named him Tim Drake, they would have all known somehow he was going to be involved as Robin and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, but that character makes no sense. But by far, you know, as we've talked about with, with Ledger, makes makes no sense that, that he's not somehow involved in the film. Uh, but what makes no sense whatsoever is the fact that Batman is Batman for a year and quits for eight years mm-hmm. before he comes back. Right. And supposedly he's all broken and can right. <clears throat> can barely walk and stuff. But but you know when we saw at the end of uh, at, at the end of the uh, the Dark Knight, you know he was still pretty mobile and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But he's to the point where he's almost an invalid, mm-hmm. which of course makes no sense because then he goes back out as Batman, right. gets his back broken, and somehow manages to recover from that while lying in a in a in a prison to the point where he's climbing up that uh, yeah. uh, out of the prison and able to you know have a rope wrapped around him like it would have just snapped him in half and killed him for sure if he was in in that bad of shape it just none of it makes any narrative sense whatsoever there is no logic to that at all and then the idea that that um that batman quit in the first place he actually goes to gordon he says well batman wasn't needed anymore Mm -hmm. that that was the thing that was such anathema to me batman it's not about the biggest crime it's about whatever crime in that great story from the 70s there's no hope in crime alley he says you know the loss of a dollar to you he's saying to a poor man loss of a dollar to you is as important as the loss of thousands to a banker crime is crime and i will stop it that's the determination that 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 uh, that Batman has, and Nolan's determination is a, I mean, Nolan's Batman has no determination, and is a complete just wishy-washy uh, guy who's ready to, to quit at the drop of a hat over mm-hmm. and over again. Yeah, that, that to me is just not Batman. That's my one teeny tiny critique of The Dark Knight Returns, is that Batman is retired. And, and that's my only critique. Besides that is, I, I just never see Batman retiring. Like, yeah, he'll yeah, just he die. Stop. Yeah. That it, that it just literally, yeah. he will go as long as there is a one breath left in his body. Yeah. He's not going to stop. Yeah, he never gives up. And, yeah, and, yeah. He, and, and he was... And at oh, least, I think maybe I even said something about yeah. that in the book, the idea that at least within The Dark Knight Returns, he had fought for decades and he'd retired right. for a short time as he was older and right. you know, feeling like he'd sort of lost his um, you know, physical ability to mm-hmm. do it. But but here you have a Batman in the prime of his life in the Nolan films that, that has quit and he's, and he's partially quit because he says, oh, I'm not needed. It just, it just it, it makes no sense whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And then throughout that film, you don't even have Batman in it. Right. Uh, uh, Nolan's 
Jason's interest is is far more in, in the other characters. You know, there's there's almost uh, I forget. I, I think I eventually broke it down to you know it's a two hour forty five minute film and there's maybe you know twenty minutes of scenes that actually have the Batman character in it. It just it just it to me he his enthusiasm for the entire uh, Batman experience had completely left him. And maybe it was because of Ledger. I don't know. But but that film the, the fact that it was so wildly successful and, and critically acclaimed is still a total mystery to me. I don't see how anybody could have could have thought that that was that was a, a, a well made or, or logical or satisfying film. Everything in the movie that's good has something that's off that leads up to it. The part where he escapes that prison, that's like a, a badass Batman moment. Like, no one's been able to escape this prison except one person, and now we have you down there. Like, the the, the only person who could, could escape from that prison is Batman. Like, that's like a real Batman thing. But the events leading up to that don't make you believe that he can do it because he was crippled like five minutes before. So that, it loses something there, and I don't find Bane a fascinating character at all. I think he's rather weak. I I don't really care too much about him. I don't really care too much about Talia al Ghul in that. Now, one thing that, and when we we were talking about this earlier, and I wanted to circle back to it, it was it was when we were talking about Mask of the Phantasm, and there's that scene at the end where Alfred talks to Bruce Wayne. The one thing that drives me absolutely insane about Dark Knight Rises is that Alfred is not a rah rah guy. He's like this downer guy who abandons Bruce Wayne. I hated that. Yeah, Alfred's like the greatest soldier ever. Like he's like Bruce. I love you. Like I'm just going to support you in whatever you do, whether I think it's right or wrong. Regardless, if you want to do it, I'll just follow your lead and do whatever you say, and and I'll support you. This version of Alfred that Michael Caine gives us gives us this this guy who's not anything like Alfred at all. And and to add insult to injury. Right before he's leaving, he tells uh, Bruce Wayne that Rachel didn't love him and she was going to run away with Harvey Dent. Like, just really, not only is he not a rah-rah guy, he's also not really a warm guy to drop that on him. Like, it was, it's just terrible. What are your thoughts on the Alfred character? I completely agree with you. That whole scene was so off pitch, in my opinion, because the idea that Alfred would be like, you're spending time in this awful cave. But in, in, in yeah. the time honored Batman tradition, Batman, you know, is, is on this quest, and Alfred is supporting him in that quest, and yeah. both of them see the positive in it. It, it, is, it is actually their home, and it is their work, and it, yeah. it is something they're doing for the betterment of all people, you know, all people in Gotham. And it's like, this, this, this is a job worth doing. And, and you know we're proud of doing this job, and and and, and you get out from like say there's times where he's going to question Bruce. He's either going to be bemused or mm-hmm. horrified by him pushing it too far. Like man, what are you doing? But he's still going to always support him, and they're going to see Batman as actually a a, a, uh, a positive force in Bruce's life in terms mm-hmm. of him trying to move beyond the death of his parents and, and and do something in terms of in terms of making the world. A better place. Batman. Batman should be should be something that is that is not. You know, when when Alfred says, "Oh, you're in this awful cave," it's like that cave is home. There's a moment in the animated series, <clears throat> uh, one of the Scarecrow episodes, where where uh, Bruce is sleeping down there, and he's like, "It's good to know I'm safe here." Um, and you see, like the shadow of a bat over him as he's laying in his bed down there. Uh, the, the cave is a sanctuary, and, and it, they couldn't have gotten it any more wrong. Alfred is a sanctuary, and, and both the cave and Alfred, you know, is, is presented as actually being tormentors to Bruce is like completely backwards. It's just mm-hmm. just is totally totally off pitch in terms of what the character in his world should be about. Like Alfred abandoning Batman is just like terrible because Alfred's the guy who's running the show, really. I mean, yeah, how, yeah, exactly. how, how are the bills getting paid? Bruce Wayne's in his cave all day plotting how to rid the world of all these criminals. Who, who's paying the bills at Wayne Manor? Who, who's cleaning? Who's doing the cooking? Like, Alfred is just as important to Batman as Robin or Batgirl or anyone else that's in the Bat family. Like, it just, it just didn't make any sense that that entire movie and 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 here's another thing and i i never understood this but at the end of the movie there's some people who don't believe that at the end of the movie that's actually 
Bruce Wayne and Selena Kyle that Alfred sees in that cafe. And I thought, you know, the, the movie is clearly flawed and there, there's a lot of problems with it, but I thought that was the one thing that they really did get right. So that at the end of the movie, when he does see Bruce Wayne in that cafe, like Alfred's wishes have come true and he actually sees him. Like, I was surprised that a lot of people were like, oh, that might have just been a dream of his. Like, I thought that was actually real. What did you think? Is that real? Well, I think Nolan has even said that it was real. I feel like that there was some statement he finally made on that, saying unequivocally that it is not a a wish or a dream of Alfred, that it really is real, which is all well and good. But by that point, it meant nothing to me, because the idea of that stupid nuclear bomb, as as Batman's flying that out into Gotham Harbor, supposedly is supposed to have a six-mile blast radius, and then there he is going out there in his, you know, it's it's being pulled by the Batwing, or Mm -hmm. the Bat, they call it, I guess. And then, uh, then all of a sudden, Bruce is able to get beyond a, a six-mile blast radius while he's still flying that thing out. Um, that doesn't—it just doesn't make any sense. How would he swim back? How how could he possibly have survived that? And people are like, "Oh, well, it's because he's Batman." It's like, but he wasn't Batman enough to stay Batman yeah. for more than a year. He couldn't even you know walk around without a cane. It's 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 all it's all so completely illogical. The the, the end in terms of whatever it meant. I was just happy it was over. I. It, 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 I couldn't decide if it if it was. I kind of thought, <clears throat> excuse me. I kind of thought about that as well too. That um, you know, were we looking at something that was just somehow in Alfred's, you know, mm-hmm. in his head, kind of a fantasy that he was hoping that that's how it would end up. But uh, but I was so disgusted by by the entire proceedings that I decided, well, whether it's whether it, Alfred is. is, is Thinking it or it's real or whatever, none of it, none of it makes any sense. Let's just move on to the next people who are going to mm-hmm. make a Batman right. movie and get out of this. Right. <laughs> Last thing about the Dark Knight Rises: What does this movie get right? I don't know if there's boy. I disliked everything about it. I hated the Bat. I didn't think that that made any sense. Um, uh, oh, the insanity of, of the, the the banking scene when the Matthew Modine character is like, well, we're not going after some bank robbers. You know, we're going to get the guy who killed Harvey Dent again. Oh. The the incredible fixation with Harvey Dent. Yeah. Um, it, it, it just and you had those guys in the bank, you know, terrorists that are killing people, and then the cops are not going to go after them. All the cops supposedly locked underground. I oh my god. Um, Catwoman. I, I thought. I thought that uh, the Selena Kyle character. Um, I thought that, that that was pretty cool. I thought Anne Hathaway did a did a good job, and that was a neat way of presenting the character looking exactly like Catwoman without ever saying Catwoman that she was just a cat burglar and stuff like that. I, I thought I thought she was pretty cool. That that would probably be my favorite part of the movie. Oh boy, this is this is a tough one for me because there's so every time I I think of the movie and I try to think of something positive, more negative comes in. The, the, what I really hated is how Bane is able to to get to all of Batman's toys. He has his own tumbler. Like when I think of Batman and his stuff, like it's only his. Like you can't get the tumbler anywhere because it's his. It's made for him. That suit made for him. All of his other gadgets made for him. No one anywhere like you'd have to actually go make it yourself and create it yourself to have it so there's so many flaws but i guess my favorite part of the movie is him getting his back broken by bane i guess that's the only thing i can say good about it because that is a pretty good fight yeah and that does very much that that looks so much like a a great live action version of that that sort of iconic common comic moment so yeah that's pretty cool um oh one other thing that's funny to point out and i think i did point out in the book that we were actually there for the filming of the stadium scene with the uh football oh. stadium blowing up yeah. where we're one of the extras way up in the stadium there oh. uh but even at the time i thought it was funny because uh what happens is bane comes out and does the whole uh, little speech thing about this is the guy who can disarm mm-hmm. the bomb or right. whatever and and the directions to all of us in the stadium were oh you've had this explosion you're terrible Terrified, and you you uh, you you listen to what Bane says as you all sit there, and you don't know what to do. And all of us were standing up in the stands, and all you could hear because Bane's dialogue is garbled through the whole movie. Yeah. So it's over the loudspeaker. He's actually talking through the loudspeaker in the yeah. in the uh, in the uh, football stadium. It's like rah, 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 like Charlie <laughs> yeah. Brown's teacher or something like that. And <laughs> yeah, my wife and I were being like, "Well, we wouldn't be too afraid of this, would we? I don't even know what's going on here." <laughs> So, but yeah, that that whole scene. 
seen that whole thing about the blowing up of the football stadium and the, the, all the cops being underground. It was all just the silliest amount of nonsense. It was, it was, you know, up there on a par with with Batman and Robin in terms of like none of this makes even the slightest bit of sense. Like, what are you, what are you doing here? Yeah, so I. <laughs> There's very, very little. I, I was just happy as it ended. I was like, well, I don't know what happens from here, but at least we're done with this. I, I'm ready to move on. And I, I had felt disappointed in the Dark Knight, but I still, I, I didn't, I didn't see the, the the train wreck that I thought the Dark Knight Rises was coming. But like I say, it did so well um, in, in terms of theatrically, and the reviews were so, so good. It still, still mystifies me. I, I'm very surprised that people uh, took to that movie the way they did now the good stuff because everything that we've talked about up until this point is in your book now since the book was originally written in 2005 and then I think revised in 2013 with all the Nolan stuff added on to your book the stuff that's happened in recent years is not in the book so I'm very curious to hear what you have to say now Ben Affleck being cast as Batman I like Ben Affleck. I think he's a good actor, and I like Daredevil. I know there's a lot of people who hate that movie, but I thought he did a pretty good job in that movie, and I think it's a pretty good movie for that era of Marvel, like Marvel, the first round of movies they did. I think it's pretty good. So, were you against Ben Affleck being Batman? Because me, personally, I, I like him, number one. And number two, after the Heath Ledger thing, I learned, like, you have to keep your mouth shut. You have to see the movie and then criticize. You can't criticize before you've seen the finished product. So, were you against Ben Affleck being cast as Batman? I was thrilled with Affleck being cast as, as Batman. I had thought, I thought, this is the best. This guy, I, I, I still laughed about it at the time in the sense of, okay, so when Keaton was cast, you had a, you know, maybe five, ten, uh, you know, wiry little guy being, right. being cast as Batman, you know, sort of weak chin, not mm-hmm. looking at all like the, you know, the six two, two ten uh, character that he's always been in the comics and stuff. And and this time around, you've got a guy. I think I think Affleck's maybe six four. He's you know he's just build just completely ripped, devastatingly handsome. Uh, uh, you know, Oscar winning director, acclaimed actor. It's like how in the world are people upset about this guy being right. cast as Batman? I was thrilled. I thought I thought man, they couldn't pick a better guy for the role. And again, as I say to you, I never see because of my you know love of the stovepipe hats and the, the mm-hmm. capes and cowls. I don't see any movie unless they sort of fall within my uh, my uh, uh, interest. Mm-hmm. So I had never seen Affleck in anything else, mm-hmm. and I was like, I love this guy. I, I think this guy's going to make the perfect Batman. Right. So no, I was in terms of whatever fanboy reaction there was to that. I had nothing to do with that. I was I was completely on on board with him from from the word go. I like Batman vs Superman. I saw it. I, I was with you. I, I was doing my own Mark Reinhardt impersonation. I saw Batman vs Superman a number of times in the theater when it came out, and I really enjoyed it. My only critique in the movie is Superman got in the way. I loved all the Batman parts. I thought it was an interesting story, but a lot of people don't like this movie. So where do you fall? Are you a fan um, of Batman? I, I was versus able Superman? to write a detail about it on um, on Batman on film, and I could really discuss um, uh, both my the things I liked and the things I didn't like about it. And by far the number one that I did not like is the concept that um, that. Batman versus Superman in terms of the fight to the death. The fact that the entire film was structured for that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, the idea that, that both of them are unknown entities to one another, uh, to me to me, the film still would have worked mm-hmm. with, without it being a fight to the death. They could have actually been wary of each other, trying to figure out each other where they stood, maybe even some fights and stuff. But the fact that Batman went directly to the fact that I'm going to kill this guy sight unseen is the thing that that, that bothered me, and and that I shouldn't even say it bothered me. It actually tormented me. That 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 to me was so against the characters of Batman and Superman that, that for all these years it, it actually it actually upset me to to see them go in that direction. <clears throat> but that said. Um, even though even though that bothered me, um, what they were doing, I think Snyder was just going to try and try and make the the, the climactic scene to, to uh, Miller's Dark Knight Returns. That's where, where he was going with it, and that's what he'd gotten in his head, and he couldn't see it any other way. To me, to me, you could have had almost exactly the same film without it 
being without it being the fight to the death. But that's how he wanted to mm-hmm. to sort of sort of spin the film. That that was the the line they wanted to take. That people going in thinking, oh, Batman and Superman literally will will try and kill one another. Um, that's the thing that that upsets me. But then the thing that that I love about it once you get past that part of it. Um, and once once you have the two of them on the same side, um, in terms of in terms of where it goes from there, both with the Wonder Woman character, with Batman and Superman, the big fight at the end, and the individual Batman scenes, I love. I I really feel like if you were a Superman fan, you'd probably be a lot more upset about the film mm-hmm. than than a Batman fan. I'm like you. I loved it, and I saw it repeatedly. <laughs> um, I saw it twelve times in the theater, and every time I saw it, I left, and I left happy, happier than I'd been with with. Uh, much much happier than something like The Dark Knight Rises. I really felt like this. This is a, a great Batman film in the sense of how cool Affleck was and in, in so much of it. Um, so so I like that, but but I still I, I still am just disappointed in, in the idea of, of where they wanted to take it story wise. That they they should have they should have made that film without it being uh, you, you know so uh, so much that oh we're gonna have Batman and Superman try and kill each other sight unseen. It just they're right across the bay from each other. Mm, with right. Batman doing detective work from Superman being able to fly, wouldn't they have already made contact with each other and sort mm. of established some sort of wary coexistence or something like that? That that was the thing that, that logically had, it, it bothered me. What are your feelings about the Martha line in that movie? Well, it's kind of funny. You can look at it two ways. It could be slightly clever in the fact that that really is a nod to their you know, their thirties origins, both mm-hmm. characters. Uh, but it could also be looked at as what a what a silly you know what, what a conveniently silly clumsy uh, plot mm-hmm. device it is. I, I again, it, the Martha didn't bother me as much as is. I I'm I'm not kidding you that I couldn't look at, at the film. I couldn't watch Batman with. With uh, that kryptonite sword at Superman's throat, I couldn't do it. it. To me, it was it was the it was the absolute antithesis of what those characters should be about, and it, it just it just broke my heart to see it. So I, I, you know, every time I saw it, I was almost looking away from that part. So so the part that it got to the Martha, I just I just didn't. Uh, all of that was a little off off of uh, it. Had already kind of become something that was invalid to me. I just I just couldn't see it. And you know, doesn't it? seen it with the film that they went out of their way that they wanted to make Superman weak that the whole idea was let's let's you know Superman is supposed to be this sort of godly being let's try and find a way to just make him vulnerable and to me that that bugged me that they went too far and just they didn't let him be Superman um, oh in fact we didn't mention this in terms of the animated series remember they did that uh, um, that three part uh, um, episode that was eventually released as a sort of standalone mm-hmm. film called right. World's Finest right. that to me was a much much better way to, to to handle Superman and Batman's first meeting. Mm-hmm. You know, there's conflict. There's even you know true true animosity between them, but they're able to finally form an uneasy alliance. That that, that to me was, was much much better than, than than what they had done with with uh, with Batman versus Superman. Um, but I'm again I'm I'm like you. There was enough in the film to love that, that I was happy to see it over and over again. And, and I, there's you know certain Batman moments that I've taken away that are as good as to me anything that's ever been done but but I just felt that, that Snyder's just fixation kind of like we talked about with Nolan and his fix, fixation on Harvey Dent Snyder had decided what he wanted to do and he wasn't going to be talked out of it that was the way he was going to go with it so Martha anyway that's a long that's yeah. a very long answer for that but the Martha thing didn't bother me as much as it was a way to get out of a situation that I hated so much I was just glad they got out of it anyway they'd get out I'd be happy Wonder Woman is used well in the movie, but could have been used better. I I, I was always, whenever I would would, would think about where this movie is going to go and, and in the lead up to it, all right, how are they going to use Wonder Woman? I always thought that she should be the one, like, hey, stop fighting. They're, like, we need both of you. Like, let's all become a team. I didn't really like how Lois Lane was the one who, like, that Martha line, but I didn't really care Either way, like the Martha line can stay in there. I don't care. Like I was, yeah, yeah, it, it didn't bother me. I yeah. was, I was much more bothered by by the idea of them fighting to the death yeah. As, yeah. than I was by the Martha line. Now, if they would have done Batman, Superman, the movie, which is world's finest, those three episodes edited together, that would have been awesome because 
I, I just think that's a better story than Batman v Superman because we have the Joker who thinks he's come up. Okay, I can't kill Batman because he's immortal, but if I get this this foreign object from a different planet, I can kill Superman and I can get Lex Luthor to pay me a bunch of money for having this thing. Like I think that's a way more interesting story than what they did in Batman v Superman, even though I am a fan of that movie. Yeah, and I am too. The the, the standalone Batman sequences, <clears throat> the saving the saving Martha Kent uh, mm-hmm. sequence, and the first scene when he's uh, um, you know stopping the, the human traffickers and the big Batmobile. You have to have a Batmobile right. chase sequence. Uh, the, you know, any Batman film's got to find a way to get that in there. Right. And then the entire big ending, you know, which basically played like an episode of of, uh, of Justice League mm-hmm. cartoon made into live action. Gal Gadot was just so awesome. Yeah, and, and to me, that they were all three. Uh, Cavill, her, and, and and ass like that was just so cool. I, I just, yeah, I just for me, I always walked out of the theater happy, and I loved the hint in terms of the relationship between Diana and Bruce right. at the yeah. end when when he kind of says under his breath, he's like, you know, men are basically good. He's right. been brought back around that he's he's thinking, you know, this fight is worth fighting. And again, mm-hmm. to me, that's the the number one thing with Batman that it has to be that this fight is worth fighting. Um, I love the I love the kind of relationship between them that, that was that is obviously going to be colleagues but uh, kind of like with the a- animated series when they did the Justice League series it eventually became a slightly leaning toward like could this be a romance type right. thing but their affection for one another both personally and professionally I think it's going to be just an awesome part of Justice League I, I just can't wait to see the two of them work together I think they're both so spectacular it's going to be so much fun It could develop into a relationship because in Wonder Woman, the Wonder Woman standalone movie, they're emailing each other back and forth, and he's, oh, I found this for you, and so it could, it could develop into something more. Now, one movie I really wanted to ask you about, it's not a Batman movie per se, but he does appear in it, and some major players in the Batman universe are a part of the movie, Suicide Squad. What do you yeah, think about this? Can you this believe movie? we got through this whole discussion without ever mentioning Harley Quinn yet? My God, how do we how do we not have any discussion about her as we discuss the animated series? Because right. that is such a major, major part of the of the Batman mythos. The character, you know, we don't get too many new characters that really right. stick. You know, and, and Harley is one of them. Harley is actually up there with all of the the majors. As I yeah. talk about, you know, uh, Joker, Penguin, Riddler, Catwoman, Two Face, um, Harley is is right there. She's every bit as great of a character. Um, and, and the fact that, that we got to see that in, in Suicide Squad looked so promising, and to me, it just ended up falling so flat. Um, I thought the I thought the film was was really bad in terms of the, the Joker Harley stuff. I love Affleck again right. with his few scenes. Well, I saw it repeatedly, and basically, I would go into a movie theater, see it, and then you know sneak over to another showing a few minutes mm-hmm. later and see. You know, it was basically a six minute movie for me. It was like a six minute Batman the Animated Series episode. To watch both the part with with right. Deadshot and the part with uh, with uh, Joker and Harley, seeing those Batman scenes was was all I was interested. In. And I thought they were fabulous. I thought I thought especially the the Deadshot one uh, was was just uh, amazing. But in terms of where they took the Joker, that to me is not mm-hmm. again not a particularly riveting uh, version of the Joker. And Harley, where they went costuming wise in her shirt, Daddy's little monster. Mm-hmm. The fact that they objectified her and sort of sexualized her in a very creepy way. Um, I know the character is going to be sexy, but but that to me was not right. That 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 was something that that was was not where Harley should have gone. And I tell you, like within the Arkham uh, um, video games and stuff like that, you could have sexed up the costume from the. Uh, uh-huh. of, from the animated series and still had it had it you know be kind of a little bit more adult mm-hmm. character right. but just where they took it to me just didn't didn't make any sense at all you hit the nail right on the head best part of the movie is the dead shot scene and that all and that and that scene right there is the one that made me abandon Christian Bale as Batman and I like Ben <laughs> Affleck better because of that that voice changer that's what it's about I can't stand the, the growl that Christian Bale does and when I heard that you know that dead shot I don't want to do this in front of your daughter when I heard that with the the voice changer sold me best part of the movie only reason I see it on TV every once in a while on the movie channels and I only tune in for that part and then when that part's over I'm out. Well, I was 
Yeah, I left instantly after the Batman scenes. I got out. I did yeah. see it all the way through, maybe twice, but yeah, yeah that that was enough for me. Yeah. I, I just, to me, it, it watered down the the wonderful part of it in terms of seeing Affleck. Um, oh, and one funny thing is, you mentioned the voice. We hadn't talked about that with with Bale. I always found it funny that within the first film, uh, the, the the growly voice was not there. He did right. not do that. Um, one of my absolute favorite scenes is when he's in the cave with Rachel. Right. He's talking to her and saying, you know, uh, Crane was just a pawn. We need to be ready. And he's talking in a normal voice. That's one of my favorite uh, Bale Batman scenes. As, as the voice got more and more over the top, I thought that that, that was just silly. and that, that didn't that didn't work for the character in terms of what, what they were doing. I got it. I mean, I kind of see why they did it. It didn't ruin anything for me. There was plenty of other things that, that, that ruined the films for me other than the voice. But, uh, but I'm kind of with you. Uh, but yeah, I, I loved, I think Affleck, I think his look, I think his his uh, acting, I think his attitude about the character, that he came and at it with a uh, um, with a respect for the character, but with a sense of fun. I, to me, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just thrilled with him. I, everything about Affleck has, has made me happy seeing him play the character. And the way he wears the costume, I never see him. Like when George Clooney wears the costume, I see George Clooney as Batman. When I see Ben Affleck as Batman, I see Batman. Yeah, I, I'm that way as well, too. In fact, in talking about like Batman collecting, uh, I have an inordinate number of, of, of Affleck Batman right. figures, and then I even made my own poster. There wasn't a good poster of just him. The only things you could get were kind of like more computer art renderings right. and stuff like that. And I was like, man, I want I want a big poster of Affleck as Batman with my other you know stand up full size you mm-hmm. know Keaton and, and Bale downstairs and stuff. So I had to had to find a way to actually copy and photograph. And, 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 and print out my, my own my own uh, um, Affleck Batman uh, because I was like, well, nobody's done it for me. Nobody's done justice to him, and I saw so this do it myself. <laughs> But yeah, I, I love him. I, I think the, the the criticism that's been leveled at him, I, I completely disagree with. I see, I see why some of the you know why people felt that Batman vs Superman was or V Superman was kind of a, a morose film. You know that, that took some pretty glaring missteps. But still, to me, none of that none of that is uh, is is uh, Affleck's fault at all. Jared Leto as the Joker. I didn't see enough of him to to say that I hate him or, or like him or love him or whatever but what i saw i didn't like so what's the verdict on him again completely negative the joker as i said is somebody who's he's so vain and he's so like his manners would be exactly uh horrifying horrifyingly prim and proper as he's this horrible crazed killer but he would be so full of himself um he's not going to tattoo damage to cross his forehead that's just not going to happen that, that's not that's not the character uh, that, that to me is, is they just went for some sort of different edgier version that, that didn't have anything to do with who the joker would have been in my opinion again as i say you can do whatever you want with them that that's only the way that i see the character you know they can be bent and shaped any any way you want but in terms of the time honored traditions of the character that just didn't didn't work for me mm-hmm. same with harley i mean to me that that what what they did with her, uh, they they really ruined a, a, a great character with, with the direction they took her. This show is my my brother's favorite show right now on TV, and I don't know why. I watched the first three episodes and I was out. I have no interest in it. It didn't hook me at all. Don't Gotham. even need to go down it. Gotham. <laughs> what are your thoughts? I don't love it. I don't like it. At I, all. I'm I'm not watching a Batman show that doesn't have Batman. I'm I'm a cape and cowl guy. If you're not putting a cape and cowl in it, don't even bother talking to me about it. No, I have I have no interest in it whatsoever. Um, and it's kind of funny because at the end of last season, they did move it. They teased it toward uh, Bruce in a mask, and and I forget if it was like a hoodie sweatshirt kind of around that all of a sudden started to look like it. But to me, the entire concept is flawed because. Uh, um, it, it, Batman should actually be the one that sort of uh, being the one that kind of spawns all of this craziness within Gotham in terms of there could be crime beforehand, but the costumes kind of come out of this this uh, this you know shadowy figure of the night that all of a sudden these other uh, sort of crazed costume visages are are, are, are you know coming to, to to challenge him and stuff like that. It just doesn't make sense that that um, you know it should be reactionary to Batman instead of actually everything happening before Batman even gets there. And plus, the timeline doesn't make any sense. 
Right. You're just waiting for the little boy, and all these people are completely grown. And right. Yeah, that, that to me, uh, I, I I have watched none of it. I did watch the last scene so I could see when he had his mask and stuff. Uh, but but it, until they get him in a cape and cow, I tell you, if cape and cow shows up, all of a sudden they'd probably have me. I'd probably be there every episode from then on. But at this point, no, I, I had no interest in it. I thought it was going to be like NYPD Blue, but with Jim Gordon. Not that at yeah, all. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Something yeah. along those lines, yeah. yeah. I don't know why they didn't do that. But anyways, a, a few more questions, Mark, and I really appreciate you being so generous with your time. Just a few more here. Of all the direct-to-DVD and Blu-ray movies that have been done, so we have like Year One, Dark Knight Returns Part 1 and 2, Batman vs. Robin, Son of Batman, Under the Red Hood, all of those movies, what's your favorite one? You know, it's tough to say. When they did uh, The Dark Knight Returns in Year One, I do love both of those, but in some ways, they're such a, a direct remake of the actual books. Mm-hmm. Maybe I don't watch them as much just because, you know, it's it's just as easy to go and turn the pages as, as it is to, to bring those up, and it didn't give me anything extra. I think I think Year One, especially, if, if there had just been more Batman in it, um, as much as I loved Year One, it always struck me that you didn't get much Cape and Cowl mm-hmm. stuff in it. Right. If, if they had uh, expanded that with a little bit more, I would have I would have really enjoyed that. Um, I ended up hating the Killing Joke. I thought that what they did with the Batgirl character in that was 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 needless and, and was again very sort of self serving and objectifying her. That 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 to me was totally the wrong way to go. Mm-hmm. The part that's just the, the Killing Joke is is kind of cool, but uh, but that I, that doesn't work for me. So I don't. If I were looking at all those. Maybe I would say Gotham Knight, and I think that might be the very first one they did. But what I liked was only a couple of episodes. The one they did, the the Deadshot episode, was just stunning visually and story-wise. I thought that that was amazing. That would probably be, out of all the the direct-to-video, you know, DC Animated Universe stuff they've done, that's that's been my favorite. Um, And I'm very excited about Batman vs. Superman. Uh, Excuse me, uh, Batman vs. Two-Face. The idea of, you know, Adam West's last performance and Shatner in there and the the preview looks like that could be some good escapist fun as well, too. Um, In terms of all those others, though, I can't remember. Oh, you know, this is worth pointing out. This isn't something I ever get to say publicly, but I'm I'm happy to get the chance to say it. Mm -hmm. I am continually shocked that a lot of these films are actually very, very edgy and uh, Mm -hmm. near R rating, and then uh, they're placed in the kids' section in all the stores. You go into Target, Mm -hmm. and uh, Assault on Arkham, uh, the the Arkham Asylum one that they did, the the DC animated uh, universe film, uh, which was just, just, really, really raw. It's like right next to, you know, um, all all sorts of kid stuff, you know, Disney things and so forth. I I can't fathom how people haven't caught on to the fact of how inappropriate that is. Last question, Mark. Obviously, the future of this character is very bright. We have movies coming out. We have more of those straight-to-DVD and Blu-rays. We have tons of comics coming out, even though the prices of this, you know, you, you have to be Bruce Wayne to afford this to read about Bruce Wayne, and you have to be a you have to commit a crime to read about crime fighters. You know some of the prices on this stuff is up there, but obviously the future of the character is very bright. But is it is it possible that there could be some point in the future where there's an oversaturation? Like, what do you see the future of the the character looking like? I don't think there can. Uh, my personal belief is that. Uh that, that Batman is a, a character that, that's, that's like Santa Claus in, in the sense that, that what he represents is, is something that is, is so good, the intentions are so good, um, that you just can't get tired of, of, of seeing him. Uh, I know that, I, I, that there could be no oversaturation for me and, and for every little kid who dreams of, of you know, not only action and adventure and heroism, but, but you know, doing the right thing, trying your hardest, trying your best. Um, to me, that, that never gets old. Um, you know, El, you know, and obviously my other hero, the, the real hero, is, is Abraham Lincoln. You can't ever have too much Lincoln. You can't ever have too much Batman. To me, to me, those are those are ideals that are that are set, you know, uh, on a pedestal for us that, that that we don't, you know, we don't ever get tired of trying to aspire to. Mark. 
plug your books, um, your music. <laughs> yeah, working, well, working on Amazon, for- actually, I'll, I'll tell you, Amazon.com, you can, you can find everything, which is pretty cool, because if you, if you type in my name, you would get not only the, the three books, which is uh, um, Abraham Lincoln on screen, uh, the Batman filmography, and Chet Atkins, The Greatest Songs of Mr. Guitar, but you'll also find uh, my uh, CD project, Mark Reinhardt and RMT, the, the music's also under my name there as well, too. So, so all those, you know, the, the, it, it, that sort of distills me down to what, what I think is, is the, the best parts of the stuff that I've done over the years. Mark, this was great. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm so happy to do it, and I just, just enjoyed it. We, we went hours beyond what we thought we would, and I, I feel like we could go even hours longer. It was wonderful.